Welcome everybody. It's great to see most everybody made it here despite storms and some uh, rather impressive circling of the Midwest. If you want to hear Dave Wagner's story over dinner, you, you, that, that one is, is worth retelling. Um, anyway, thank you. Um, we um, um, have a really exciting full day. We're going to learn a lot today. We're going to listen. We're going to hear from those on the ground taking science and using it. Um, and it's, it's going to be, I know, extremely informative. I don't want to spend any more time than necessary on preliminaries. So uh, we'll go around the room and do an introduction. Um, just name and where you're from. Do we need anything more than that? So we'll do the room first and then go around on the on the on the phone. I'll start and then we'll, we can go this way. Does it matter? So um, welcome again. I'm Kathy Kling from Cornell University and I chair the Water Science and Technology Board. And yeah, we do. Thank you. We need to use these um, doohickeys. John Arthur, Florida Geological Survey, WSTB. Tom Graziano, NOAA. I'm Mark Lishvai. I'm retired. I'm a member of the Water Science Technology Board. Stephanie Johnson with the WSTB staff. Dave Dezonbach, Carnegie Mellon University. I'm a member of WSTB. Max Gomberg, California's Water Resources Control Board. Oh, um, should I do it again? Okay. John Dupnick, Texas Water Development Board. Suzanne Dorsey, Maryland Department of the Environment. Laura Ehlers, I'm a senior staff officer with the Water Science and Technology Board. Carl Rockney, National Science Foundation. Ken Bellitz, U.S. Geological Survey. Kay Whitlock, Christopher Burke Engineering, Chicago. Nusha Jami, Stanford University. I'm a member of the WSCB. Jay Family at the University of Saskatchewan. Uh, Dave Wagner, this is not contagious what I have. <coughs> it's a result of doing a, a stupid run last week at 10,000 feet in the Rockies and realizing I'm not as young as I used to be. Yeah. Um, Water Science Technology Board, <laughs> um, retired, part-time work with Wolpert Engineering. Sandy. Sandy Eberts with the U.S. Geological Survey. Deb Wixon, National Academy staff. Richard Ort, Maryland Geological Survey. Andy Staley, Maryland Geological Survey. Bill Cunningham, USGS. Josh Shioti with the Pacific Northwest National Lab. Michael Zwern with Resources for the Future. Adam Benavides with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Bob Bastian, EPA, Office of Water. Jeannie Aquilino, WSTB staff. Courtney Devane, WSTB staff. Brendan with the WSTB staff. Abigail Ullman, BCST staff. Steve by American Water Works Association. And Jeff Lape with EPA's Office of Water. Um, uh, we are joined by seven, seven folks on the phone, so um, if each of you could um, jump in and say um, your name and where you are, and um, I know, when, I believe Wendy's on. Yes, I'm here. Why don't you, why don't you start, off, start us off, Wendy? Okay, Wendy Graham, I'm with you in spirit, stuck in Charlotte and rerouted home. I'm with the Water Science and Technology Board. Others, please just chime in. It's Chio Sham with Eastern Research Group. Bill Werkheiser, Department of Interior. Okay. Thank you. Jeff Plumley, USGS. <clears throat> Lauren Shapko. <clears throat> Any others? This is Jennifer Arrigo from the US Global Change Research Program. Great. Welcome. Kathy, one more thing. I know Tom Fraser is trying to join as well before 1030. Thank you, Wendy. We'll um, keep, a, keep a lookout for that. Thank Excellent. You. Well, we're sorry you didn't make it, but super happy you're home safe and can um, join us by phone. That's 
more important than anything. Okay. I, I don't, are there any other preliminaries we need to do? So I think we should just dive right in. Um, we are going to push the first session to, um, instead of stopping at 1030, more like 1045 to uh, account for the fact that we always have this sort of startup intro time. So we'll do um, about 25 minutes for the presentations. We'll take a few questions after the first um, presentation and then um, do the second one and have questions for that and then any general conversation until 1045. So thank, uh, with that, um, welcome to Tom Graziano and I'll, I, I'd prefer to let everybody just do any more introductions they want than that, so. Okay, great. Is this on? Can you hear me? It's on? Great, okay. Uh, first of all, thanks, uh, Kathy, Elizabeth, uh, w Water Science Technology Board members, guests, the staff, thanks for the opportunity here to represent NOAA and speak uh, on NOAA's behalf. Tell you a little bit about what we're doing in NOAA to transform our water prediction capabilities. I am the uh, director of the Office of Water Prediction within the National Weather Service, and, and one of the assets, we have folks distributed in three geographic locations, one of which is at the new National Water Center in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, which I'll talk about in a bit. And um, I'm also the chair of what's called the NOAA's Water Team. So it's a team that uh, basically represents water interests across the whole of NOAA, and I'm responsible for coordinating activities across NOAA related to water. Okay, uh, just to provide a little context, I'll talk a little bit about strategic vision for the Weather Service. We just came out with a new strategic plan, and I'll just focus on the water element. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the National Water Center and how it's serving as a catalyst to help us transform our water prediction capabilities uh, within NOAA and with uh, the broader water enterprise. Uh, key partnerships are absolutely necessary to make that happen. Talk about the National Water Model, which is a new uh, modeling capability that we brought online on the 16th of August 2016. I'll talk a little bit about another capability we have uh, with, for water resource applications called the Hydrologic Ensemble Forecast Service, and then I'll briefly summarize. And if you could, somebody could give me like a five minute warning, um, I'll know when to get into super caffeinated mode here to make sure I get through this. So, all right, yeah. thank you. All right, so first of all, uh, the, we the Weather Service mission is to, we uh, uh, produce for, uh, climate weather, water forecasts and warnings for the protection of life and property and the enhancement of the national economy. That is our mission. Uh, and our strategic plan, which just came out about a month ago, uh, from a water perspective, um, there are four primary sort of, uh, foci here. One is delivering actual water resources information to meet uh, from national to street level across all time scales. Bottom line is over the course of the last eight, eight or nine years, we've gone out uh, via many fora and interacted with all manner of stakeholders uh, within the water resources uh, enterprise. Uh, and it basically asks folks uh, essentially what keeps them up at night? What are the decisions that they make for which they have insufficient information? And when we took all that information and we integrated and we distilled it, there were five, essentially five themes that emerged and five areas of, 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 uh, of prominent concern. And uh, they are flood, drought, uh, water quality, water availability, and then climate change, which really sort of cuts across all of them. And one of the things that surprised me in this process of interacting with all these stakeholders is the desire of the stakeholders, uh, in large part, for information, which is at much higher fidelity, both in space and time, than we currently provide. Those of you that are familiar with the, what the Weather Service does now is we provide on a daily basis forecasts and more frequent in a flooding situation, but essentially daily forecasts at about 3,500 of the 8,200, uh, 30, uh, forecasts at 3,500 locations, and those are 3,500 3, of the 8,200 USGS stream gauge locations, essentially. So uh, it is a manually intensive process. It's a lump parameterized model, the Sacramento model, uh, the forecasters in the loop, uh, and so it's uh, what we're looking at, what we're doing now is expanding for the first time, uh, our first foray into high performance computing is the national water model, which I'll talk about here in a minute. And that really takes us down to the street level, you know, you know, instead of providing a forecast at 3,500 locations on a daily basis, we're providing forecasts now on an hourly basis for 2.7 million locations. So. Okay, so uh, additionally, providing minutes to months river forecasts, which quantify both atmospheric and hydrologic uncertainty, improving our forecasts of total water in the coastal zone. We've got about 120 million people in this country that live in the coastal zone. And uh, when we make forecasts in the coastal zone right now, we don't have an integration between our, our terrestrial modeling and our, our coastal ocean modeling. 
And what we're doing with our sister agency, the National Ocean Service, and also in partnership with with the USGS and with the Corps of Engineers, um, we are developing a capability now, an operational capability uh, to couple in, uh, routinely uh, our freshwater and, and uh, brackish forecast to get a total water prediction in the coastal zone. And obviously this is not just important in situations where you've got landfalling tropical storms, uh, where, where you have a large inland freshwater contribution to that that, that uh, inundation in the coastal zone, but it's important on a routine basis. And what we're basically starting out with a, with a 2D application, we're going to be coupling to AdCERC and then moving beyond that in years to come with a 3D 3D model to make sure that we've got you know vertical profiles, temperature, salinity, uh, to make sure that you know that forecast is as accurate as it as it certainly as it can be. And then uh, finally here, delivering forecasts of flood inundation linked with other geospatial information. You're really making information actionable, particularly for the emergency management community. This is a requirement that has been out there for over 20 years, where emergency managers basically say, we need information at the street level. We need to know where, there's, where the water's going to be, when it's going to be, how, when it's going to be there, how deep it's going to be, uh, so they can preposition people and resources to most effectively mitigate you know, the impacts of flooding. And I'll show some examples of that. So for those of you who aren't familiar with the National Water Center, we are on the campus of, of uh, uh, the University of Alabama in Tuscaloosa. This is our facility here. Uh, it's a Tuscan Roman architecture for those of you who have been on the campus. Uh, we actually, it's an interesting facility. It's uh, 65,000 square feet. It's a lead gold facility. Uh, we were given a triangular plot of land, so we have a triangular shaped building. And in the center there, you can barely see the top of our dome, but it was basically modeled uh, after the Pantheon in Rome. And obviously, it's not an open air oculus here, but it's it's basically modeled after that. And that's sort of the center or meeting point for the facility. And within this facility, we have uh, an operation center, which we're in the process now of spinning up. And here's a, here's a picture here. I mean, if I could use the laser pointer of our operation center this was uh for our spring flood outlook and uh the third thursday in in, Mar in march of every year we we get together uh, we, we and NOAA and other federal agencies we have a spring outlook in the last few years we've been doing it from uh the water center in tuscaloosa and um this year uh, we had a lot of interest uh, from the media given there was a lot of flooding ongoing at the time and there still is and we've been in flood as you know on the mississippi river since january and so this just gives you a glimpse into our little uh, TV studio here in the back of the room. And then the screen there in the front is the, uh, uh, this is our front screen here. And then there's room for about 28 people, seats for about 28 people in the facility. We have gotten a congressional mandate to be get operational by the 1st of October. So we've been, I'll call it quasi-operational. We're doing everything we can with the staff that we have on a routine basis uh, to provide support to our field offices um, and work with other partners. But our first 12 folks uh, will be bonafide IOC on the 1st of October with our first 12 folks. And then uh, we consider um, uh, full operating capability uh, with a staff of 48. So we can support a 24 by 7 operation. So that's, that would be our next step over the course of the next few years. And we'll be inviting other federal water agencies to take residents in the facility uh, at any time to support, you know, water prediction development, capa uh, development of water prediction capabilities, but in particular in the operation center. And I know there's been particular interest by FEMA of late to put a couple of liaisons in our facility. So we're looking forward to making that happen. But uh, we've been under a fair amount of political pressure to do that. Uh, we've been somewhat resistant. Uh, we basically said, let us get our get in the game first. And, you know, and once we get to IOC, I, I assume I look at it as we've got skin in the game. So um, we'll certainly be looking to ramp up fairly quickly from there. But it's a center of excellence for water resources, science and prediction. It's a catalyst, you know, really to uh, transform uh, water prediction through enterprise collaboration. Uh, we've had over 80 scientific meetings there in the past few years. We cut the ribbon on the facility on the 20, 26th of May. Uh, 2015, and we've had um, over 80 scientific meetings with over 3,000 participants since then. So it's gotten a lot of use. Uh, we only, the, the capacity of the, the facility is for 200 plus people. Uh, we have essentially 72 of our Office of Water Prediction folks down there, which is the majority of the people in the Office of Water Prediction. We're only about 120 strong. And um, but we're be, as as fo as folks leave federal service or those that are interested in moving down there, we're moving. Uh, we're on a path to move everybody down there. So we have 
more than just critical mass, but you know, the entirety of our OWP staff down in Tuscaloosa. Okay. Uh, in terms of key, uh, partnerships, and this is absolutely critical for us uh, moving forward, uh, one of our uh, partnerships I like to highlight uh, is the IRIS partnership among uh, the GS, CORE, NOAA, and FEMA. Uh, back in the you know, 2008, 2009 timeframe, there was a, and via meetings among our federal water agencies, there was a you know, general recognition that you know, the, the nation's water resources challenges are growing, they're becoming increasingly complex, they're multidisciplinary in nature, and more important, they were bigger than any one agency. So we really needed to work together to try to solve you know, the problems that we faced. We worked together on a routine basis, for those, those of you that aren't familiar with that, you know, the, the GS has the observational infrastructure, they, they bring a lot of science to bear, they you know, provide us with all the rating curves for the you know, re, uh, relating flow to stage at our forecast locations. Uh, the Corps obviously does the water management along with the Bureau of Rec. Um, and then we're, we're, our swim lane, if you will, is prediction. Uh, we, we're responsible for provide, uh, generating the, and, and issuing uh, both forecasts and warnings. And then FEMA's got the response and mitigation piece. And clearly, uh, you know, as we talk about the enterprise, a key uh, additional key relationship is with the academic and research community. Certainly here we're at the National Academy of Sciences today. Uh, we've been working with Elizabeth now for a few years uh, in earnest. Uh, we have a relationship with the National Science Foundation and QASI, and for those, I think many of you are probably familiar with QASI, but it's a consortium of universities for the advancement of hydrologic sciences incorporated. And what's important about that relationship with NSF and QASI is ever since we cut the ribbon on the water center on the 26th of May, 2015, a week later, we started what we call our Summer Institute, which is a seven week in residence program at the water center uh, where we work through QASI. We advertise this broadly among all the academic institutions across the United States to try to bring in the best and, best and brightest graduate students uh, to the water center for the seven week in residence program to tackle our biggest challenges with regard to the hurdles we need to get past to, to evolve our water prediction capabilities. It has been a, a tremendously successful program. And for us, in addition to not only, you know, accelerating development and implementation of new capabilities, it provides us the opportunity for a seven week a seven week interview with these folks that are in residence with us. So we've hired a number of them and they've been become key members of our team. Um, and uh, we've been doing that every year since our fifth summer institute is is under is underway as we speak now, uh, and we work very closely with uh, UCAR and NCAR. Uh, UCAR, um, we recently stood up a group called the Community Advisory Committee for uh, the Office of Water Prediction. What we wanted to do is reach out to the broader enterprise and and hear from the enterprise in terms what their thoughts were in terms of what our plans are to evolve our predictive capabilities. So this. This CACWP or Community Advisory Committee for the Office of Water Prediction, we first met um, in uh, was the very uh, January um, 30th, 31st, and, and February 1st in 2018. Uh, uh, we got together. There were essentially 25 people on this team. Uh, it's it's co-chaired by David Maidman out of the University of Texas and Don Klein, who's the Associate Director for Water at the United States Geological Survey. Um, we've got a lot of federal agencies uh, represented, uh, the private sector, uh, NGOs, and, and, and a number of people from the academic community. Uh, and that has been a very successful interaction for us. Had our second meeting uh, during the AGU meeting last year and planning a third meeting uh, this fall. And our focus, one of the primary recommendations of this group was really for us to uh, establish a community development environment. And one of the things that we've been touting about the national water model that I'll talk about in a minute is uh, utilizing the model as a service, essentially uh, making the model modular enough so that we can, uh, any entity, you know, other than NOAA can develop a specific application that that, you know, if we have the, the, the appropriate interfaces and APIs that it sort of plug into the architecture. And you can configure the model however you want for whatever application you want. And we and NOAA will configure it as we deem appropriate to support our operational mission. Okay. And then, uh, of course, water resources managers, emergency managers, and other enterprise stakeholders. So these are the key partnerships um, that, that we've been engaged in. Okay, so setting the stage for this transformation, uh, three, we've been resourced by Congress in three broad areas to, to evolve our enterprise. 
Uh, one is a centralized water forecasting demo. These resources first became available in 2015, and that was really demonstrating for the first time uh, uh, running a, a high-resolution continental scale model in a high-performance computing environment in real time. And that became, uh, just about a year later, uh, what was became the implementation of the National Water Model on the 16th of August, 2016. Um, we accelerated based upon you know, the interest of Congress, we, we, we actually accelerated that implementation quite a bit, you know, uh, more than, than we had originally planned. But uh, nonetheless, we got the model out there. Um, we haven't solved world, world hunger yet, but we have basically evolved it considerably now um, over the past few years. Uh, we implemented, I mentioned version one in August of 2016, then, you know, version 1.1, 1.2, and then actually tomorrow we, we implement version 2.0, where we actually go OCONUS for the first time, and we will pro begin to provide uh, a hydrologic forecast capability for the very first time, uh, at least from a NOAA perspective, for Hawaii. Uh, so that's a big step for us along with a number of other enhancements to, to the national water model. Uh, associated with that also is a centralized water uh, uh, resources data services and then an evalu evaluation service. Obviously, you can't manage things very well if you don't measure it. Um, and then uh, uh, the following year, we were resourced up and we've continued to be resourced uh, and, and to enhance our water prediction capability. We've demonstrated a hyper-resolution modeling capability, a real-time uh, forecast inundation mapping capability, and then linking uh, basically the forecast that we generate with you know, geospatial information, whether it be demographic, infrastructural, economic, political, you name it, to make that information actionable. Um, for, for decision makers. And I'll talk a bit more and show some examples of the real-time flood forecast inundation mapping capability. And then in 2017, this was about standing up the water center, uh, expanding NOAA's uh, WCOS, which is the Weather and Climate Operational Supercomputing System to support this, this foray now into high-performance computing uh, in the water domain within NOAA. And then, uh, as I mentioned earlier, coupling uh, the national water model with ADCIRC and our wave, watch wave, wave forecasting capabilities within NOAA to get total water in the coastal zone. So the water model, it's a continental scale water resources model, um, uh, providing you know, high, high resolution spatially continuous information. Uh, this, you can see the map on the right there. This is basically the NHD plus uh, version two uh, stream network uh, generated by the USGS and the EPA. Uh, it is the hydro fabric on which we generate our forecast. And um, you can see that close up here on the right, um, these colored dots here simply represent uh, USGS stream gauges that we currently make forecasts at. And then you can see the spatial fidelity here um, uh, in the stream network. And for every little segment that you see there, we provide a forecast on an hourly basis. The bottom line is we have four operational configurations of the national water model. We have an analysis cycle that runs every hour. And every hour, we also have a, a short range forecast that's driven by our, our atmospheric model. It's called our high resolution rapid refresh model, which is our highest resolution uh, convective, convection resolving model at three kilometers spatially. Um, and it goes out through, essentially, we, we, we utilize that input, that forcing out through 18 hours. Then we have a medium range version of the forecast, which is, which is forecast by our global forecast system, which was just upgraded last week, which is essentially globally a 13 kilometer uh, resolve forecast um, that actually goes out through 16 days. We simply make our forecast out through 10 days utilizing that because it's essentially deterministic in nature. Uh, one of the things that, however, we'll be doing with the version 2.0 of the model is we will be um, issuing uh, medium range ensemble forecasts out through eight and a half days uh, beginning tomorrow. And then we have a longer range version of the forecast, which we run four times daily. It's a 16 member ensemble driven by our climate forecast system in NOAA. Um, so again, four, four instantiations of the model or configurations, uh, and we're generating information on an hourly basis. Uh, for 2.7 million tree reaches. And the other thing is it's not just what we've done historically in the weather service is simply provide forecasts of quantity, uh, you know, the flow, um, you know, and then we convert to stage usually utilizing rating curves provided by the USGS. But one of the things we learned going out and talking to all manner of stakeholders, people were very interested in getting information, which was you know, more information than just the quantity or the flow. Very interested in other parameters which, are full, which fully define the, the water budget in any particular catchment. And so we essentially provide, you know, more than 40 parameters that are for analyses and, for, and, and provide forecasts for about 40 different parameters 
you know, every in each one of those uh, forecast cycles, the national water model for each one of those 2.7 million catchments. So we're producing a lot of information every day. And so it's sort of overwhelmed. It was really, if we were just to dump that on the doorstep of our forecast staff, it would be literally overwhelming. So one of the things that we've been doing, and we've been doing this as part of our Summer Institute, we've been doing it in close partnership with the USGS, is generating our, and we have a geointelligence division. It's one of the, the five divisions that comprise the Office of Water Prediction. And our geointelligence staff, uh, many of which are located at the National Water Center, are developing hydroinformatics capabilities. And I'll show you um, a few of those here in a minute to really, you know, extract the full utility of the model and, and make it um, uh, so that a, a forecaster at a weather forecast office, of which there's 122 of them, or one of our 13 river forecast centers can actually take this information and use it to support decision support. You know, uh, we call it impact-based decision support services. Okay, and you now if we can make this animation go, Let's see if I can, so let's see if that works. Oh, okay, so this is just an animation, actually dates back to 2015, just to give you a sense of, of, of you know, the fidelity of the model and, and, and what we're doing here. Um, this is a, a three month, a, a three hour time step for the months of uh, May, uh, June and July of 2015. Um, and it's basically just showing the, the, the stream flow in, in uh, cubic feet per second. And it, uh, you know, basically you can see where uh, you basically had rain hit the land surface and then it basically works its way through the stream network. Um, and you can see this was a particularly active spring for Texas. There was a lot of flooding in Texas, uh, in East Texas, uh, um, fairly devastating, um, you know, in the spring of 2015. And they've had, you know, a lot of subsequent flooding, as I'm sure you're well aware. But um, anyway, that, that this, the flooding during um, uh, this time frame certainly represented here. That just gives you a sense of an animation here. Um, and I'll go to the next slide. So some of the collaboration with the USGS, I know our next speaker is, is, is from the USGS, so I wanted to certainly uh, touch upon some of the things that we're doing with the USGS. Um, and uh, these, these collaborative um, activities here are supported by the USGS is uh, what they call 2WP, it's, it's Water Water Prediction Work Program. And um, we uh, got the senior leadership of NOAA and the USGS together about a year and a half ago, and we made a commitment to uh, partner in these respective areas. One, uh, observations, you know, basically doing a, performing a gap analysis to determine sort of what the best uh, uh, investment strategy would be to support, you know, high, high fidelity terrestrial a continental scale terrestrial modeling. And um, I'm sure, I think you'll probably talk a little bit about NGWAS or maybe touch upon it, but the Next Generation uh, Water Observing System, USGS was funded um, this year for the first time, some initial funding to begin to support that effort. And that's the focus this year is in the Delaware River Basin. But it affords us the opportunity to look at what data have the biggest impact and what's the biggest bang for the buck from an investment perspective to support, uh, you know, uh, forecasts at this fidelity, uh, establishment of a community modeling development environment. So uh, one of the things that I mentioned that, you know, was really, uh, excuse me, yes, five minutes. Okay, thank you. Um, establishment of a community, mo community modeling development environment. I mentioned the Community Advisory Committee for Water Prediction. That was a pr primary recommendation they had. And this is something that we've been working with on the GS. Uh, and with uh, our folks at, at the National Center for Atmospheric Research who developed the WARF Hydro architecture, which currently is the architecture we utilize uh, for the National Water Model. And then development and application of hydroinformatics, I covered that, and then co-development of enhanced water prediction capabilities on the NHD Plus channel network. One, improving stream flow and, and temperature water quality. When we're talking about stream flow, particularly low flow or temperature, certainly need to couple with a, a shallow, at least a shallow groundwater model. There's been a lot of work that's been going on between the GS and the and NOAA in that area to couple a, a groundwater model, a national groundwater model with the national water model uh, to do it at the level of sophistication that we'd like to do it. One of the things we need to do is we simply need to rewrite the, the we need to re-architect the national water model. We need to re refactor the code in, in more modern languages than Fortran. And um, we made a commitment with the USGS about and, and NCAR about 
a month ago now to do that. So we're going to continue to evolve our existing capability, and then we're going to put a small team together. We're in the process of putting a team together to basically uh, rewrite the code and make it you know, really modular in nature that supports not only enhanced interaction with, with NCAR and with the USGS, but anybody that wants to work in this domain. Okay. All right. Um, here's just a couple of examples of, so uh, back in uh, August, uh, I want to say it was August 20th, let's see, this is um, August 27th. So uh, uh, Hurricane Harvey made landfall on Friday at about midnight, and that was, I think, August 25th. Um, on Sunday morning at about 6.40 a.m., 5 a.m. Eastern time, I got a call uh, from the director of the Texas Division of Emergency, Emergency Management and said, we're aware that you have capabilities that could support us in this flood fight. Can you guys, we know you're not operational right now because we weren't. Can you spin up to support us? And I said, uh, let me talk to my boss. So I called uh, Louis Uccellini, those of you that know him, he's director of the National Weather Service and said, you know, I had this conversation. He says, can you support him? I said, I think we can. I, so uh, we rallied our troops, you know, our visiting scientists, our contractors, our federal staff who were, Lord only knows where that weekend called them all in on a Sunday. They worked all night. And uh, by the next morning, we had, you know, written, uh, basically evolved our capabilities to run uh, on a cron so that we could produce every day on a daily basis by 10 a.m. Uh, Eastern time, 9 a.m. Central time, a suite of products to support decisions being made by the Texas Division of Emergency Management. And um, the, uh, these products basically augmented what the Corps of Engineers was doing with their H&H their &H models on basically the main stem rivers. So um, basically this is you know, providing information where otherwise we wouldn't have any. And this is just an example of one of our, one of our hydroinformatics capabilities. This is time to bankful flow, which is essentially a one and a half year return flow as you know, surrogate for bankful. Um, this is Buffalo Bayou downtown um, uh, uh, Houston. Uh, this was helpful information to them to know when we would achieve a, a bankful condition. Uh, we also basically took um, uh, the, the water model uh, output and uh, uh, generated inundation maps. We did analyses. We did forecasts using, you know, the, the flow at any particular time. And also what they were particularly interested in was uh, ma us mapping the peak flow in the next five days. They really wanted to know where it was going to be wet. And if they knew where the maximum extent of the inundation, they would know where, obviously, where it was going to be dry. And they were basically, you know, plucking people off of rooftops, trying to set up staging areas. And they absolutely had to know where, you know, things weren't going to get wet or inundated. And the light blue here is simply um, our RFC forecast basically routed through the NHD Plus stream network and, and the uh, inundation map um, generated uh, utilizing that approach. And there's the water model inundation. Verification showed that these were basically 70 to 80 percent accurate, if you will, um, you know, in terms of a hit. Uh, we talked to FEMA, you know, they, they've, they've basically told us many times, don't let perfection be the enemy of good. We've been operating for, for 20 years without information, you know, please provide us what you got. And bringing it down to home stretch here, so uh, for those of you familiar with what we do on a routine basis, this is... Um, uh, our, our, our weather service main page, our, our AHAPS page, Advanced Hydrologic Prediction Service, here's all the points that we are routinely making forecasts, color-coded based upon level of threat. Um, you, when you come to this page, you see all the USGS observations, and then you can also see the, the forecast based upon them. Um, this is an ensemble approach in terms of water resources and longer range uh, predictions, which quantify certainty. Uh, an ESP approach, which really based upon um, historical climate forecasting, forecast forcings. Um, here is the new hydrologic ensemble forecast service, which basically accounts for both atmospheric and hydrologic uncertainty, accounting for the best atmospheric forecast we have. Um, and you can see, a, a, difficult to see here, but it is a product which basically uh, better accounts for the uncertainty. And it does it not just in the long range, but from minutes to months. And then we certainly plan to use a national water model for that application. Uh, the longer range version of the national water mo model right now only goes out through 30 days. We've been experimenting for the water year uh, in, the, in the Rio Grande Basin um, uh, with, with some fairly positive results, you know, uh, the natural flow forecasts. Uh, but the bottom line, you know, we've, we continue to work on that. And then um, summarizing here, uh, our water services are evolving. 
uh, you know, continental scale modeling approach, uh, producing con consistent street level um, some of the sea information. We're implementing um, a, uh, a much more physically based approach, and we're doing this in partnership with the broader water enterprise. And then we've got this new organization, which is the Office of Water Prediction, which we were formed on the 1st of April, 2015. And we've got our new National Water Center, which truly is serving as a catalyst to, to make stuff happen. And it's, um, it's a lot of fun. I will tell you, um, in my federal career, which is about 35 years, um, I've been in this for business for about 35 years. This has been a really fun project. And it's really nice to be a part of an, a, a, a project where you really can affect some substantive change. And that's what we feel about this project. And, and, and I think what's being born through the partnerships uh, with our federal water partners, the academic community, the NGOs, and really the private sector, tr it's really an exciting time. So with that, I'll, I'll take questions or take questions at the end, or how do you want to do that? Yeah, we have about five minutes for, for questions. So um, first, let's thank our speaker. That was excellent. Wonderful overview. Um, so please, we'll we'll do the put your flag up if you'd like a question. And every once in a while, Elizabeth will remind me that there's people online. I just um, I just came from a WMO meeting, so I'm really used to this. Okay, stuff, yeah, so, yeah. And, and yeah. Then I, I will do, do my best to keep the correct order. So I have John, Nusha, uh, Dave, right now. So John, please. there we go. What is the plan or the strategy for? Um, adapting the new elevation models based on LIDAR as this moves forward? Well, the, we are, one of the things we're doing as part of a, um, well, first of all, the, what, what USGS is doing, like with the 3DEP program is really critically important to where we want to go that, you know, terrain and bathymetry data or much higher res resolved terrain and bathymetry data are really critical to what we're doing because Essentially, what we're doing right now in the model, it's a sort of a very simple channel parameterization. And we want to, what we showed in last year's Summer Institute is that the more highly resolved, as one would expect, uh, uh, the channel, the, the more accurate the forecast. Because essentially, what we're, and, and the more accurate, uh, you know, not only the, the flow, but the, the conversion to stage, because we back calculate Manning's equation as part of our effort to actually do the inundation mapping. And so, uh, and it actually had a really profound impact on, on our forecast. So one of the things NOAA is involved in right now is the, uh, we have a NOAA uh, 2018 and 19 a DOC, Department of Commerce Agency Priority Goal. There's four of them. And we own one of them in, in the Weather Service and the Office of Water Prediction. And that is to demonstrate in real time, demonstrate real time flood inundation mapping for the state of Texas. And so what we're going, we're doing right now is basically going in and enhancing uh, the channel definition wherever all those data are available to enhance the quality of the forecast that we produce and the associated inundation. And then demonstrating how to make that information in real time and to be able to communicate and link it to infrastructural information to support the decisions that are made. So, but again, that information is really critical to us and, and um, you know, strongly support what the USGS GS is doing, in particular with regard to the three depth effort. So, thanks. Yes. Or who, I don't know who's next, but yeah. Hi, this is Inger Padilla from the National Science Foundation. Um, I, most of this modeling is deterministic, except I guess the probabilistic one that you mentioned at the end, which I'm going to guess it's uh, stochastic. Is there a yeah. plan to integrate artificial intelligence in the data uh, assessment and prediction? So, so first of all, with the, the, the last thing I show is the hydrologic ensemble forecast service that's, you know, that is, um, you know, that, that ensemble provides, you know, uh, stochastic model provides, you know, uncertainty information. Uh, with regard to the national water model, we do have a long, our 30 day forecast is an ensemble driven by our climate forecast system. And with the implementation tomorrow, the upgrade version 2.0 of the national water model, we will be providing a medium range ensemble. Um, the um, uh, help me out of the rest of your the question. I'm sorry, I just artificial, artificial yes. So w we we are dabbling with artificial intelligence, not necessarily in the quantification of uncertainty, but more um, in the dealing with anthropogenic processes. So. Um, you know, trying to predict what a water resources operator would do a week from now, two weeks from now, three weeks from now, based upon a particular inflow or pool elevation or whatever other parameters are deemed relevant by the, by, by the model. Uh, we have done this for the ACF basin with, with, um, uh, with 
fairly good results. Um, uh, but uh, that is our first foray with AI in terms of supporting, addressing a particularly large challenge with for us with the national water model. Because remember, we're running this off in a high performance computing environment. We don't have a forecaster in the loop that's accounting for what a reservoir operator may be doing. So we have to find a way to account for that over time. And, and that is essentially how we're trying to do it. Okay, I think we have time for two more questions, um, and then we'll have to we'll have to cut it off. So, Nusha and then Dave. Uh, Tom, thank yeah. you for your presentation. I was actually part of the original National Water, um, oh, the, uh, water the Center, summer Institute uh, ensemble uh, uh, oh, um, summer. forecasting in the 2000s. Okay, gotcha. oh, okay. Um, gotcha. I, I wrote two papers on that, so um. I'm a big fan. Uh, my question for you was: uh, Are you guys able to provide any? Um, information about the recent Northwest or the, the Arkansas actually uh, flooding, um, the Midwest flooding, um, and were you involved in some of that forecasting? Was Did they use some of your forecasts for decision making and um, uh, well, we, disaster we, management? Yeah, so we were heavily involved in that in terms of, you know, our, our field offices, our river forecast centers and weather forecast offices you know, communicating uh, forecast information, potential impacts. Um, and at the disposal of our, our staff, they have both the forecasting applications that they run, you know, the lump parameterized Sacramento model uh, that, that they operate, as well as the output of the national water model. Uh, the extent to which they use the national water model for the Arkansas flooding in particular, um, I don't know the details of that. I don't know that we've really done, gone back and done an assessment of that just yet because we have literally since January been in flood on the Mississippi and it's just been, we, no pun intended, inundated. You know, I mean, our, our river, for, our, weather, our weather forecast officers are staffed to be 24 hours a day. And as you know, our river forecast centers are staffed to be 16 hours a day. And, and many of them, and at least in the, in the uh, Mississippi Basin, have been operating on a 24 hour day basis for a really protracted period. So they are, you know, they're all hands on deck just trying to provide service. So we haven't really had the opportunity yet to go back and do an analysis of, you know, how well we, how well we did in particular. So thank you. Uh, thanks, Tom. Great presentation. My question is, during the last administration, we stood up the Internet Water Program, mm -hmm. and it subsequently transferred down to Duke University, mm -hmm. and currently it's being, for the next two years, kind of developed right. there. Do you see, it? my question is, do you anticipate that that would have value bringing it into our national water models? Yes. yes. It's interesting you asked me that question because I just mentioned with the, you know, the putting my thing like... Uh, uh, name tag up sideways there. I came from WMO. Well, uh, one of the individuals that went with me is I was the sort of lead for the water part of the delegation. Uh, one of the folks that went with us is Peter Colahan, who is in charge now leading the effort for the Internet of Water. Peter used to be one of my five division chiefs in the Office of Water Prediction until December of last year. Uh, he was the uh, Service Innovation and Partnership Division Director. And so we brought him back to support the WMO effort. And, and yes, we have been coordinating and we continue to coordinate with Peter. Um, a lot of, the, you know, the day, data that would be captured via the Internet of Water from the states uh, would certainly be of value in terms of initializing, uh, calibrating, and even verifying the national water model. Uh, so, yes. Thank you. Thank you. And, okay. Ben. Yeah, outstanding. Thank you again. Uh, that sure, was really you. great. Yeah. Really excellent. Um, so uh, next, we're going to turn to the USGS, uh, a partner, um, and Sandra Ebert. Um, and while um, she's getting everything ready to go, um, at, 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 there will, we'll have time for questions after this. And um, if you if you're in the audience and you want to raise a question too, you can do that too. Sorry, you don't have a card. Just just wave, and I'll put you in the in the queue. So please, Sandra. I uh, thank you. I'm Sandy Eberts, and I've been with the USGS for a little bit more than 30 years. I currently am with our water mission area uh, headquarters and our office of planning and programming as our program science coordinator. I'm going to talk for about 15-20 minutes about USGS water priorities. Really, to meet 21st century water resource challenges, uh, we have uh, identified four priorities for targeted investment and effort. Uh, a number of years ago, we brought on a new associate director for water, Don Klein, many of you know him, and he had a vision that if we restructured and realigned the work that we were already doing, some of our very good work, we could actually 
uh, produce some new water products for the nation. And so I'm going to talk to you about, you know, where we're headed with that. We have four water priorities that are interrelated, um, enhanced observation networks uh, that are part of our uh, next gen water observing system priority. This data we envision served through our modernized uh, national water information system. And these data and uh, uh, water delivery systems directly being coupled to modeling and new modeling tools to drive prediction. And then finally, all of these uh, are integrated into water availability assessments. Now, we've done a lot of assessments over time. We've worked in water availability assessments. I started way back when we were doing regional aquifer assessments, you know, 25 years ago or more. We have water quality assessments. But what we always had were different uh, funding line items where we were doing water availability here and water quality assessments here. And we did work together as more organically or scientist to scientist. But now we've realigned um, so that we're actually co-planning and, and standing up our assessments holistically. And I think that's really exciting. It's something we've wanted to do, but now we're structured so that we can do that um, much, much better than we had, had been able to before. So I thought I'd just share some of the uh, drivers of our four priorities that I just mentioned. Of course, we've had a science strategy. We work from that science strategy. But in 2018, we also had recommendation from the National Academies um, for future water priorities for the nation and really looked at our research efforts and, and provided some suggestions there. And I should mention with our restructuring, we finally have brought our researchers into, you know, the broader community of water uh, resource professionals in the USGS. And so we're really aligning our research much more closely with some of our higher priority and larger uh, products that we're producing. So that's also exciting. In 2018, there was a presidential memo on Western water availability, and that's driving some of what we're doing with our integrated water availability assessments. The Secure Water Act of 2009 uh, required us to develop a national water census, and we're still doing that, and that's integrated into those water availability assessments as well. We receive input from the water subcabinet. You know, this is a federal uh, group of federal representatives from multiple agencies, EPA, DOI, USDA, uh, NOAA, uh, Army Corps, DOE. And these folks are meeting at a high level periodically so that we are talking across all of the uh, sectors that have federal water responsibilities. And that's also new and very exciting. And, and we, USGS, have been tasked with advancing water prediction uh, the enhanced data collection, as well as integrated modeling, which you're going to hear a little bit more about. And then, of course, we're across the landscape. We have water science centers in every state. We work shoulder to shoulder with our partners. We have many stakeholders. And that also feeds into our overall directions because we are very well connected with, you know, the country and what its needs are. So I'm going to start by talking about our water prediction work program because that most closely aligns with what Tom just spoke about. This is our national uh, effort to develop modeling tools that enhance and drive water prediction. It's part of this ambitious federal partnership that you heard about for developing a new national water prediction capacity built on collaboration. First and foremost, we're working to improve and augment our predictive water modeling capabilities across a range of spatial and temporal scale. So we are working nationally uh, with NOAA and others. We also are enhancing our water prediction capabilities at smaller spatial scales as well. And as part of this, as you just heard, we're working with others to cultivate this broad collaborative national water modeling community. We have shared computing environments that we're standing up uh, or others are standing up and we're sharing data, we're sharing modeling uh, components and interfaces, and we're having forms that uh, um, are being held collaboratively. One of the first things we're doing this with this Water Prediction Work Program, or TWP as we fondly refer to it, is we are working to enhance the national water model of the, of the Weather Service by working with them to develop a groundwater module to improve base flow prediction, and that's forecast predictions. And then I also heard someone asking about uh, topography. We are also working on enhanced topography and bathymetry so that we can also help uh, inform uh, uh, more accurate predictions as well. 
And then we are taking our USGS science, a lot of our process science that many of our researchers have been working on, and that is incorporated into a variety of different models. And we are working to couple some of those key models and, and processes into the national water model to drive prediction of stream temperature first and foremost. So we have um, the National Weather Service predicting stream flow. USGS is coming in, helping improve that accuracy with more groundwater uh, simulation, but then also we're jumping on and doing temperature prediction and also sediment uh, and constituent prediction. We're working towards uh, capturing uh, sediment as it comes off the landscape and forecasting that as well as entrainment of those uh, various uh, water quality constituents in the sediment and transport of that in stream. So we've been involved in prediction for a while, but now we have a concerted effort to do you know, large scale prediction. At present, this is a fairly new uh, team, and what you're hearing about today, again, are our current high priorities. It's work, a lot of work we've been doing uh, already, but now we've aligned into these four high priorities and aligned many people who had been working on similar work, but maybe somewhat disparately. And so we have just recently stood up these various science teams as part of our 2WP program. And each of those science teams has just been finishing up their science prospectuses for their their piece of this overall effort just this summer. Um, so for example, our temperature team is working on how USGS science and data for water temperature can be used to forecast stream reach temperature. Our hydrology team is a team working to incorporate groundwater into the national water model. Our interoperability team is the team that's working on how to model, how model components uh, should be modularized to you know, better uh, be used to predict multiple uh, components of the water cycle. Previously, we had an office of groundwater, an office of surface water, an office of water quality, you know, very successful efforts. But our model developers for each discipline were in separate offices. Our restructuring has put all those model developers together in a team. And so we can um, more uh, accurately and, and better align the modeling and add, you know, plug and play components so that we can model um, and use the models as needed. And this brings us to our next priority, and that is to stand up a next generation water observing system. You know, as you're aware, we have nearly 3 million stream reaches in the country. We have 10,000 stream gauges. That's monitoring less than 1% of all of those stream reaches. And actually out of those 10,000 gauges, only about 8,200 monitor stream flow year round, continuously. But these modern models that you're hearing about, they need higher density data and they need data that describes more than stream flow. We need information on groundwater levels and soil moisture and ET and water storage and snowpack and such. And so our current monitoring networks limit our ability to accurately understand and to predict water resource conditions using these advanced models. And that's what this NGWAS, uh, or Next Gen Water Observing System, is all about. But we can't monitor everywhere at high density, spatially and temporary. We know we can't do that. Um, and so the strategy is to develop highly instrumented networks in about 10 medium-sized basins across the country that represent some larger water resource regions, such as the regions you see here. And so once we highly wire these particular basins, we can better understand our systems and extrapolate that knowledge through models. We also are augmenting our existing stream gauge network that we already have across the nation by adding temperature and some other uh, probes to collect some additional information. And all of this is to predict more, accurate, uh, more accurately the water quantity and quality in use at unmonitored locations. So ultimately, our next-gen water observing system is intended to provide real-time field and remote sensing data on all of these uh, components, stream flow, stream velocity, water cycle components like ET and snowpack, a broad suite of water quality constituents. So we don't have our national water quality assessment project anymore, but that data are being collected through our networks uh, still and are being incorporated into these integrated assessments still. 
And we're looking a little bit more in terms of monitoring between groundwater and surface water, and that might be interest, you know, of interest to this particular group today. We, we're here gathered uh, around groundwater. We're installing piezometers and stream banks where we're collecting temperature continuously, as well as the temperature in the stream to be able to better understand exchange of water between groundwater and surface water, and a myriad of other technology to get at groundwater surface water interactions. Of course, sediment, transport, and water use are also a big part of this. The next-gen water observing system is really a combination of um, mobile and fixed assets in these uh, 10 basins. And again, we're not there yet, but this is where you know we're headed. So we have a pilot, and that pilot, as Tom mentioned, is in the Delaware River Basin. And we have enhanced mainstream monitoring on our stream gauges by adding temperature and salinity monitoring at more of our gauges or at all of those gauges and enhanced our communication systems as well. Another very exciting aspect of the next gen water observing systems is we're standing up these innovation sites, sites where we identify locations where we're testing new technologies, uh, we're allowing people to test opera operational um, uh, operationalizing some of their existing technologies and encouraging people, not just USGS, but universities and states and others, developers, to come to the same locations, use this as a test bed, compare their results that they're getting with other people's results as well for new water quality and flow technologies. We've added stream monitoring in smaller uh, sub-basins of these watersheds. We typically have not had stream gauges monitoring you know, watersheds that are less than 50 square miles, but we know that that's important to our ecological systems. And so we're adding basins or, or gauges in those sub-basins to better characterize hydrologic dynamics and improve hydrologic and ecological models. Again, innovation sites in these smaller streams as well. And not all of the monitoring with um, the next gen water observing system is continuous. We do have plans and are collecting some discrete data on a limited scale. Really, uh, the gist of the next gen water observing system is really to drive innovation in monitoring. And that brings us to our next priority, our integrated water availability assessments. As I mentioned, we're aligning all of our assessments so that we have a more holistic understanding of um, water supply and demand, quality and use in uh, various settings. And, and um, we're working towards evaluating long-term trends in water availability. And this is inclusive, again, of water quantity and quality. We've always done a lot of water quality trend work. We've actually done some, a fair amount of water quantity trend work, but this is being aligned. Providing seasonal and decadal forecasts of availability and informing water resource division uh, decisions bringing in some social economic tools, which is somewhat new for USGS. We're piloting this as well. Um, just as with our 2WP, we have teams that are, you know, standing up projects. And I forgot to mention with NGWAS, we also have, you know, people working on various types of technology and we have technology prospectuses that have been developed this summer as well. Uh, our pilot project, our first pilot project for the IWAS, which is how we fondly refer to this priority or program, is in the Delaware River Basin because the idea is if we have all of this uh, new data and all of this really wired watershed, how do we get that into models? How do we inform the assessments? And so our uh, water prediction folks who are developing the modeling tools and our assessment folks are in the same basin with our people who are standing up the next-gen water observing system and working with the local stakeholders also to identify what's important to them. So we have these tools and these approaches that we're gonna march across the landscape, but when we're in basins, we also wanna answer local um, uh, questions of interest. And in the Delaware River Basin, um, the question or interest is really drought, and we're improving our stream flow prediction of uh, drought, uh, or during periods of drought with this project. We're also, um, developing a model to predict public supply well use on a daily basis, which is you know, part of our water use program is being incorporated into this. Because we always put out our water use compilations on a five-year cycle, it's a, it's a very useful product, but it doesn't always meet the needs of folks in the interim, and so we're using a lot more modeling to predict water use in various categories in the interim. And so we're working on some public supply well uh, modeling tools in the Delaware and also simulating water quality trends. 
We have a second uh, pilot basin for the IWAS um, down here in the Trinity. And this project is um, also looking at long-term trend analysis and at socioeconomic impacts in response to supply and demand scenarios. So that's something that they're looking at. We had an infusion of directed co-op matching funds this year to be able to uh, fund some projects that would help us push our uh, integrated assessments forward and we're funding some work to look at data and information delivery and uh, processes for incorporating water quality and groundwater into some of our predictive modeling as well. The um, IWAS is national and it's also regional. So we saw the Delaware River Basin pilot, but we also have tools that we're working on nationally. We're um, uh, developing data, uh, consistent spatial data, temporally and spatially across the country for many components of the water cycle. That's one of the directives through um, the Secure Water Act. And so we have national deliverables that speak to that. And then we have some regional deliverables. So above the line, these are our national extent deliverables in the near term. By the end of this year, we're going to be delivering daily information on water availability indices focused on quantity. And this is an indice, so this is not predicting, you know, availability um, in terms of absolute amounts, but these are relative amounts. Um, and by 2020, that will be inclusive of water quality. And by 2021, that's inclusive of water use. And again, we have our teams who have been meeting all summer, all, all, actually this all this past year, and standing up the approaches for doing this. At the regional extent, we have our Delaware River Basin pilot. And we will be selecting the next basin to move into. That presidential memo I mentioned requires us to look at Western water issues. Both the NGWAS, our water observing system, and our water availability assessment projects are going to be moving into a basin in the West. We have stood up a team and a committee to identify criteria for selecting that basin. And we'll be soliciting feedback from outside the USGS and from stakeholders to help us identify this next basin. So again, ultimately, we'd like to have 10 of these next-gen water observing system basins. We've got one pilot now, and we're working through the process for bringing more on. And then, um, yeah, again, stakeholder engagement to stand up the next basin. And that brings us to our National Water Information System modernization. As we collect more intense data spatially and temporally, yes, five, oh, almost done. As we collect more data spatially and temporally, and we have mobile assets, uh, we're collecting data up and down streams, we have drone data, our information systems have not historically handled this kind of data. So we have a team working on this high priority of modernizing our water information system as well. We also need more automated, automated data processing because this is a high volume data. But we need our data to be rapid uh, rapidly accessible and delivered to support near-time water forecasts and availability uh, and water hazard situations. We have a lot of decision support tools. Um, we've had a lot of decision support tools. We've had a lot of mapping tools. We are streamlining our presence online, making more of a lean portfolio, making it easier to find and utilize our information. One story that really resonates with me that was told by one of our developers in Texas was, you know, a number of years back, there was a big Memorial Day flooding. His own home was at, at risk. And he was online trolling through multiple stream gauge web pages that were upstream from gauges that were upstream of his home, trying to decide if he should evacuate his family. And he was water aware. And he said, this is not adequate. People need to be able to go to a dashboard. They need to be able to really understand the situation. They developed the Texas Water Dashboard. We're looking at scaling something like that up and providing information in a way that's more useful, especially for making decisions rapidly in an emergency. So that brings me to this last slide. Some of the things that we've been uh, experimenting with is on the left, we see adding, we're adding webcams to our stream gauges. And we can see as the hydrograph unfolds here with discharge and water level, what, what does that actually look like? What, what is going on at that site? And here on the right, we've been um, creating visualizations of entire water years to see what the water year looked like. Um, and we can see the effects of some hurricanes and some drought situations and really getting a better feel for, you know, what is going on uh, in our water resources over the course of a year. And with that, I can take some questions.
That's excellent. Well, let me start around the the edges. If anyone is, since I wave at me, no. Okay. Oh, yes. Um, Charge. Uh, USPCA Office of Research and Development. Great talk, Sandra. Thank um, you. Quick question: What other water quality? You mentioned sediment and temperature? Yes. So at present, that's initially what we're looking to add to the national water model, but we still are sampling um, our national water quality assessment project networks for a myriad uh, of chemical constituents. And, and Ken is here from NACWA. I mean, I don't think anything has changed in terms of the types of constituents we're sampling for. I know we're standing up some PFAS you know, methodologies in our lab, but um, anything else? You're right. The analytical measurements are not easily replicated with the probe. So the probe development is still a key area for development. Mm -hmm. And that's a good point. We are working um, with a lot of developers on sensor technology. Um, and again, that's what some of those test sites are for. So we can test some of those out where we're also sampling um, and having uh, samples sent off to the laboratory as well. Thank you, Ken. That's great, go ahead. I just, I heard PFOS and I'm thinking, you know, there, there's, uh, there's, I guess, higher priority items from these chemical constituents because I heard a lot of actually physical parameters and not, not much on the, the chemical parameters. So uh, if, you're, if you're looking for input, nitrate would be really great because, um, yes. I mean, nutrients are our are, are biggest issue from the standpoint of, of uh, large-scale rivering transport. So rather than PFOS, I, I guess I would pitch for nutrients. Right. Well, yeah. PFOS is something we're developing some methodologies for so we can get more data on that. We have always been monitoring for the nutrients, and we have um, – uh, nutrient sensors as well, and we've had a nutrient sensor challenge. I live in Ohio, so you know, I'm very familiar with Western Lake Erie Basin issues with eutrophication, and, and that is always on our radar. In terms of what we're adding to the national water model, initially that's a really big heavy lift. It's temperature and sediment, but nutrients are not being ignored, and we are standing up more probes. And I say we're enhancing our stream gauging network. We're trying to collect more nutrient information as well, but thank you. Always good to know what people are thinking. Dave. Thank you, Sandra. It was a very good presentation. My question is, it seems that the next generation water observing system is highly dependent on data. My concern is, is that I've at least have been told by various people, Don Klein in, in particular, mm -hmm. that funding for our gauging station network in the United States okay. is shifting from federal So I'm not on the development team, so I can't speak to exactly how they're intending to uh, integrate artificial intelligence, but we have, you know, our best and brightest working on this. Next Gen Water Observing System is driving that innovation in monitoring, and it's generating the data um, that you're speaking about. We have actually seen an increase in funding for our stream gauging network and for our monitoring because of this program. So we had a million and a half dollar increase this past year and then a $12 million increase uh, proposed. So this is really getting attention and we think that um, because we have, you know, really uh, uh, done a good job in planning and communicating what the needs are and how we can help support um, the modeling efforts that we need as a nation, we're getting a lot of support from Congress. Thank you. Hi, I'm Sarah Brennan. I'm with Applied Sciences, uh, uh, NASA's Applied Sciences Water Resources Program. And I was curious about your process to identify the basins and stakeholders that you're potentially thinking about moving your pilot project to. The reason I bring it up is a few years ago, we started the Western Waters Application Office that's based out in California. And the role of that office really is to connect stakeholders in the area to data and resources, not only from NASA, but other federal agencies. So I'm curious what your plan I'm is. glad you identified yourself. Um, right now we have our uh, committee, our team that is working on the um, technical criteria we want so that we have representative basins across the country. And I was just tasked to lead the national stakeholder engagement piece only about a week ago. 
so um, I'll be glad to talk to you. But we do want to find out, you know, obviously we think if we're fully funded and again, you know, that's always an if down the road, you never know how, you know, what we're going to get from Congress in the long term. But if we're fully funded, we want to have 10 of these representative, um, highly instrumented watersheds with models and such to go along with that. But there are many more water resource regions in the country. And so we have to be selective in terms of where we go so we can extrapolate to, you know, the greater, um, the greatest amount of resources as possible. But it's really important to be answering those stakeholder questions too, because there are definitely basins that have you know, more challenges than others. And so we're trying to develop a, a plan to systematically collect that information so we can sort through that. And Don Klein really wants a nice uh, process, uh, something that's traceable in terms of our selection process. And I just met with one of our decision scientists out in Denver last week to start really thinking about where we're headed with this. But, you know, as with many of these other high priority efforts that I mentioned, we're standing a lot of this up just, you know, as we speak. Um, we're working on all kinds of prospectuses, as I mentioned. But it's not like we're um, casting aside the work USGS has been doing. We're aligning the work, um, I think, more effectively. So I don't want you to think that, you know, this is all brand new, but it's being aligned more effectively. Um, and we're just um, beginning in some areas. Thank you. Great, and we'll give Nusha the last question. Um, thank you, Sandy, for your talk. Um, I, you know, I, first of all, I really appreciate uh, appreciate seeing you mentioning that you're trying to sort of break the silos, especially mm -hmm. within the development group, which is extremely important. My question is slightly different, which is focused on terminologies okay. and the way that we report these numbers. Uh, Obviously, this generation is all about how you use multiple data sources to fill the gaps and how we sort of can create this mega data um, sets that uh, incorporates various data sources. And um, with that comes the challenge of what data am I picking from USGS and how am I aligning that with NASA data and how that sort of Align, lines up with uh, EPA data, for example. I wonder if there's any conversation going on at the, you know, within the agency, at, not within your agency, but across different agencies to sort of try to create more sort of a uniform terminologies mm -hmm. and try to sort of help the users understand what is, how these data sources match and uh, what terminology they're using for them. Sure. Um, I mentioned our Texas water data uh, dashboard. And in Texas, they're doing that. They're bringing in USGS data along with um, external data and serving it up together. It's, um, it's new for us to do that. Uh, it's always challenged our policies in terms of, you know, how we serve our data alongside others. Much of what we do when we serve USGS data alongside other folks' data, um, because it's all very good data, and if we need high-density data, we need it all, um, is through ACQUI. And I actually am the USGS co-chair for our Streamflow Information Collaborative. And we have been meeting monthly to try to see what systems are out there in terms of serving Streamflow data. And one of our tasks this year is to find out what all of that data is. And so we are having those conversations. Um, we're not there yet. But if anybody is interested in Streamflow in particular, but actually any of the um, time series data that we might want to serve from other you know, entities altogether, um, let me know and I'll make sure you get an invite to those um, discussions. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. From big national models, now we're going to the states which is a, obviously key stakeholders in the development of these sorts of tools. Um, we have um, an hour and 45 minutes in total. So um, if each speaker shoots for 15 to 20 minutes, then we'll have time for questions. If everybody pushes over 20, we really won't. So um, I'll maybe wave at you at 15 and we'll see where we go from there. So thank you. Uh, first speaker is Max Gomberg. So good morning, everyone. I'm Max Gomberg from California's Water Resources Control Board. We're the state regulatory agency uh, that's responsible for implementing the Clean Water Act, the Safe uh, Drinking Water Act, as well as running the revolving loan funds uh, for both uh, clean water and, and drinking water in California. Uh, and we also uh, run water rights, uh, groundwater management, 
and uh, a host of other programs, including urban conservation. I direct uh, our climate change program, uh, as well as work on some of our human right to water uh, work on safe and affordable drinking water and urban conservation. And I should note that uh, there's uh, in California, we have a structure where we have a, a state board with five gubernatorial appointees. Those are my board members. We also have nine regional water quality control boards, and Nusha is on one of those boards, uh, and Jay was formerly on one of those boards. So I'm going to take us through our big challenges. So we generally focus in the West on drought. However, we also get flooding sometimes, uh, not at the frequency uh, the way that the Midwest does, but uh, we've had some big ones and we're due again. Our, our last devastating flood was in 1862. Uh, and of course, with climate change, we're, we're moving to the extremes. Uh, when we get more wet, wetter, more intense, drier, uh, longer, and, and more severe droughts. And we still are very much in a regulatory and, and policy framework uh, that looks backward in terms of how we assess climate and, and our hydrology. So it's a, it's a big change and a big challenge for us. I think that this has all been pretty well documented uh, by the IPCC reports and, and, and elsewhere. Uh, the one thing I wanna note on here, which is, is really a big focus right now is that last bullet, the, the, the fire impacts. Because what we're seeing not only is, is the forests burn, but now we're seeing, because we have so many developments in, in the wildland interface, where when we have big conflagrations, they are taking out whole communities uh, and and there are really significant and and problematic water quality consequences that that co arise from that, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. So we had our our latest uh, major drought a, a few years back, and while it didn't completely wipe out our economy, uh, it had a really uh, significant impact on our, our entire economy from agriculture to our forest lands to our urban sector. And we are still dealing with and uh, adapting to the consequences of, of that drought, uh, in particular, trying to really help communities that were they experienced shortage during that drought, uh, build resiliency, build more uh, diversity into their sources and, and emergency supplies so that we don't go through that again uh, when the next drought hits, which will be soon. And of course, on the flooding side of things, um, for those who aren't familiar with this picture, um, this is the spillway uh, below Lake Oroville, uh, which is our largest dam. And what you can see here is it's completely eroded right there. Um, we had uh, several atmospheric river storms come in um, and we, we, it, it, we thought we, we were gonna have a real tragedy on our hands. We actually evacuated 200,000 people uh, from below this dam. And thankfully uh, we didn't get any more storms. Now that spillway has been reconstructed and repaired, but it's really a cautionary tale uh, which I know you all are familiar with on what happens when we build infrastructure and we don't maintain it. So I work in, in the policy realm uh, at, at the state level, and I just wanted to note uh, some of the, the major actions that have been taken over the past five years as we try to cope with our changing conditions um, and, and key challenges in the state. So from top to bottom, um, we have a new governor as of uh, this January, and he recently issued an executive order uh, directing all of the state agencies that deal with water, our Natural Resources Agency, our Environmental Protection Agency, where I work, our Department of Food and Agriculture, to inventory and assess all of our existing uh, water-related programs and data and to chart a, a path forward for for the the next what he hopes to be eight years um, on, under that administration, uh, and and one of the things that uh, our governor governor has made as his key priority is uh, delivering safe drinking water, and and to that end, um, in our state budget that was just. Uh, adopted by our legislature last week, uh, there was a major shift to take money from the state's greenhouse gas reduction fund, which had really
really been solely focused on actions that reduce carbon emissions uh, and now expand that more in a, a resilience direction um, and in particular to add to take money out of that fund um, which is is generated through a, a cap and trade program auctions um, and devote an ongoing source of, of revenue for safe drinking water we have about a million people in the state who lack safe drinking water and uh, that's due to all kinds of uh, different uh, natural and, and man-made contaminants. And m most of them live in communities that simply don't have the capacity to operate and maintain treatment systems. And so uh, this has been a big challenge for the state. Uh, there was no agreement going into this year on how to fund a solution. There was agreement that we needed to, to come up with a solution, and this is what was uh, negotiated. The state has also been uh, really focused on conservation, uh, mainly in the urban sector, uh, in, in response to the last drought. So there was major uh, legislation passed last year that sets uh, not, uh, not only new drought planning requirements uh, in terms of what uh, water management agencies have to do as droughts intensify and trying to get some more uniformity around that uh, across the state, uh, as well as specific requirements for all of our large urban agencies in terms of how they look at what is an efficient water budget for indoor use, outdoor use, and their own distribution system uh, losses. So we're working on that. Um, we have uh, passed over the last few years uh, several bonds actually, but two significant bonds uh, at the state level to make money available both for infrastructure uh, as well as ecosystem restoration. Um, it's not nearly enough and it's not sustainable, uh, which is something that Nusha and I are always <laughs> talking about. Um, and then uh, in 2014, um, as the, the drought intensified, um, we finally got it together to become the 50th state to have a regulatory framework over groundwater withdrawals. Uh, and so we're working on implementing that and I'll, I'll speak more about that in the afternoon. So I wanted to mention broadly um, what the state is doing on uh, greenhouse gas mitigation, uh, specifically to point out uh, the ways that we are trying to support that work uh, in, in the water sector in, in California. And in particular, um, on, on the bottom bullet, we're really focused on the, the short life climate pollutants, uh, both because a lot of those pollutants are created by agricultural practices. And so overall, as we try to implement our groundwater law uh, and look at uh, improving water quality outcomes from our agricultural sector, whether that's farms or dairies, feedlots. Um, we're also looking at how do we reduce the, the methane as, as part of that work. Um, in addition, uh, we have a specific project funded by uh, money that, that US EPA gave to us to look at uh, the potential for diverting organic material from landfills, uh, where it creates methane, to wastewater treatment plants for digestion and uh, development of, of, of gas uh, for on-site or off-site use. So we're, we're working on getting that report out uh, later this year. And, and that's complementary to our broad state strategy um, towards uh, really increasing our composting capacity, again, to, to reduce the methane emissions from organics going to landfills. Here's what the state's uh, emissions breakdown looks like. Uh, and if you look on the left-hand side, you can see the, the, the big majority, almost two-thirds of our emissions are from our transportation sector. Uh, people drive a lot in California, uh, as well as our industrial sector. So think cement production, et cetera. Um, but then if you look at the smaller uh, slices on the right-hand side, uh, there's actually a nexus between a lot of the work we do in the water sector and that uh, achieving reductions in those areas. When we think about uh, energy efficiency for water systems, whether that's in efficiency of pumping, whether it's conservation, um, whether it's uh, more capture of urban stormwater uh, to reduce the, the need for conveyance. Um, all of that fits in agriculture, I, I mentioned, um, and of course, the, the residential use uh, when it comes to, to water heating, uh, we're working on in, in collaboration with our energy uh, partners as well. Just to note, we have a, we have a long way to go. Um, the state set a 2020 target, which we met, uh, but our 2030 target is a real steep drop in emissions. Um, and as 
as with the global emissions picture, um, that drop is not materializing. In fact, we're going in the wrong direction. So it's, 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 it's highly concerning. So on the, the adaptation, or now the, now the word du jour is resilient side of things, um, we're really working on um, how do we go from plan and assess We've done a lot of that. We've done a lot of vulnerability assessments. Um, we've done a lot of planning, um, but to move to the next step beyond that, to actually uh, finding the will to make investments, difficult decisions, uh, that's where we are right now as a state. And whether that is uh, sea level rise or whether it's uh, communities that are at high risk of, of being destroyed by fire, uh, do we rebuild them? Um, how, do, how, how much money do we put forward from the, the state treasury, from the federal treasury, from FEMA, um, when we have those recurring disasters? Um, that, those are the big questions we're, we're grappling with right now. Um, and then, of course, on, on timing and magnitude, uh, we have, uh, as someone mentioned earlier this morning, right, a lot of our population nationally lives along the coast. Um, in California, a lot of our population is along the coast. And we're looking at major sea level rise impacts, again, if our emissions trajectory stays uh, as it is. And we're really grappling with, uh, through our coastal management agencies, well, how do we, how do we facilitate uh, retreat or uh, some type of barriers and what infrastructure gets protected first? So that's, that's a big challenge we're, we're dealing with in terms of uh, priorities as well. Uh, and then, of course, there's always this question about uh, are we going to go pace wise or are we going to try to scale up and, and move really quickly, uh, which is an, an ongoing discussion. So in terms of, of water infrastructure, um, probably the bullets on here, with the exception of the one about Proposition 218, are familiar to everyone in the room. Um, we have a, a crisis funding model um, that's true at the federal level, that's true at, at the state level. Um, we're, we're good at responding after the fact. Um, but I will note that we are blowing through our emergency response funds uh, in, in California, mainly due to firefighting. Um, we set aside $200 million um, a year for the past few years for firefighting. We blew right through that budget. Um, and as these become more frequent occurrences, uh, we really all have to grapple with um, how much money we continue to put towards emergency response um, in places where the, um, the emergencies uh, go from periodic to frequent. Uh, and, and again, on, on funding, um, we really don't have a, a sustainable resilience funding source. As I mentioned, we have a mitigation funding source, which is now being somewhat transitioned into a mitigation and adaptation source. But there really hasn't been sustainable funding put towards uh, any of these, these adaptive uh, actions. We also have a, a constitutional um, amendment dating back to the 90s. California is a, a ballot initiative state, so when something gets on the ballot and is approved, it goes into the state constitution, which says essentially that um, to raise water rates, uh, you've got to go through a process where you define the rate increase in terms of cost of service. And there's a big debate taking place through through the courts and and as well in our legislature about really what how do you define cost of service? Um, does uh, does a disaster response, for example, is that included in cost of service? Can you put a surcharge on bills for that? Um, I'd say it's still very much an open question uh, along those lines. Lack of federal support. Um, probably many of, you, many of you are familiar uh, with the fact that uh, really there's been a sharp uh, and continuous decline in federal support for water and wastewater infrastructure since the 1970s. Uh, and it's gone from 20 to 30 percent of uh, state and local funding needs to about uh, 4 percent currently. And it really, again, sort of begs the question of, is, is that sustainable given all of the challenges we face uh, over the long run? And a big focus in California uh, is equity. Um, as with many other places in the world, um, we have a tremendous amount of income inequality. It's growing. Um, and the people who are the most disadvantaged and marginalized also face the, the greatest environmental threats. Uh, and so we're trying to rectify that uh, through, through various investments, uh, in particular on, on safe drinking water. 
uh, uh, PFAS was already mentioned. Um, our, our other big challenges, um, again, sort of in the, the broader realm of funding and, and capacity, um, the, the cost of water is rising uh, much faster than the rate of inflation, uh, three to four times the rate of inflation. That is only going to continue, if not increase, uh, when we think about all the infrastructure needs, um, emerging contaminants, uh, and a host of other uh, requirements that we are now placing on our drinking water and, and wastewater systems. And, and that really speaks to that, that third bullet there, the, the, the paradigm shift. It used to be that to be a successful water manager, all you had to do was make sure that what was being delivered out of the pipes met, met the water quality standards uh, and it was reliable. Uh, now there are a lot of other requirements uh, that go towards uh, running a successful water utility or, or wastewater uh, utility for that matter. And uh, I, I see a real workforce development need in terms of the next generation of leadership uh, of, of, of water systems. And then, of course, in California, uh, where we grow uh, the, the lion's share of, of the uh, fresh fruit and vegetables for, for the country uh, and are part of a global market, uh, we, we're going to see major shifts in uh, crop patterns uh, production, uh, in, in particular as we implement our groundwater law, which requires sustainable groundwater basins. And what that means for our economy and what gets grown um, is something, again, that we're really grappling with at, at the state level. Uh, now, the, the last bullet, I actually think doesn't get as much attention as it, it deserves um, in the, the natural resources space. Um, generally, <coughs> There's been a lot written about um, the shifting media landscape and what that means in terms of what content gets produced and, and how it gets viewed. Um, when it comes to water or, or natural resources, um, we've seen the, the impacts of, of, of that shifting landscape firsthand. Uh, to give a, a brief example, um, within the, the conservation legislation that was passed last year, uh, there was a standard as part of these budgets of 55 gallons per person per day for indoor use. Well. Uh, Certain uh, memes got out there in, in the social media space about, oh, the state's going to put monitors on people's showers and, you know, limit people exactly to that and fine them if they don't, if they don't, if they go over that, that 55 threshold that got picked up um, by certain uh, national media and it created a whole uh, set of uh, waste of time for those of us who would have rather been working on implementation and now had to respond to uh, erroneous media. So uh, that's, that's a growing challenge, I, I think, that, that is worth noting. Um, in the interest of time, I'm not going to spend too much time on this slide, other than to say we are, are, are still, I think, at, at a national level, and as well as in, in the realms of, of, of political science and other disciplines, really still grappling with this, which level of government is right uh, for which type of tasks. And, and the examples um, I'll give there, uh, in California, we have a housing crisis. Um, we have 12% of the nation's population, 25% of the nation's homeless population. Um, we have uh, nearly 40% of our population uh, is unable to purchase a house. And uh, those numbers are getting worse as, as cost of living increases. Um, Housing uh, development has traditionally been a local decision. Now the state is stepping in and saying we need to have some oversight because we've got a crisis. That's creating a lot of uh, a lot of conflict. Um, on the other hand, when you look state federal, um, we've had this uh, waiver from from the federal government to set higher emission standards for vehicles for a long time. Um, there's been a lot of benefit to that, um, and of course now that is also um, a subject of intense debate. So uh, the, the summary here um, is that uh, we are not nearly putting anywhere near the amount of money we need to, to, to confront these big challenges, and, and that's fundamentally a matter of, of political will, and um, I, I, am, I would like to be cautiously optimistic. Um, I'm a, a bit too much of a cynic for that, but... Um, you know, we we do as a, a nation, as as a, a federal um, society composed of the nation and the states, um, need to to really collectively uh, uh, step up. 
And of course, as, as I mentioned, equity is a big focus here. Um, and, and this picture really um, sort of encapsulates so much of, of what's been going on. Um, so Sativa is a small water district uh, in Compton, part of the greater LA area, um, whose uh, board members uh, were, in my view, uh, criminally, at least if not civilly, negligent in running their water system. Um, the state came in last year and took over that water system. Um, there's a tremendous amount of infrastructure uh, upgrades needed to bring it up to code, and you've got a community that uh, really doesn't have the capacity to pay for that. So how do we do it? There's my contact info, and happy to take questions. Thank you. Um, let's, I think we have time for just one quick question, and then we'll move on to the next. Yes, please, Nusha. Uh, thank you, Max, for your presentation. I, I actually do want to go back to the, your comment about media. Um, as you know, uh, we did this whole study during the drought um, that showed that, you know, good media coverage of the drought really, really helped the state save a lot of water, uh, despite actually uh, uh, sort of this dislike from the water utilities because of the, you know, drop in the revenue stream and all that. Mm. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering, and, and you made this comment about, you know, sometimes these wrong information gets into media and then obviously it gets propagated much faster because of access to social media. Um, I wonder if you guys have internal strategies on how actually propagate the right set of information in a more strategic way through media rather to kind of get, a, get ahead of these comments or uh, strategies. I would also make a final comment on the fact that San Francisco has 45 gallon per per person per day um, water use. And actually this is very common in Europe as well. Right. And no one has died because of it. So um, just yeah. just to make that comment. Right. So just on, on the, the media piece, I, I mean, we've been trying for years um, with our legislature to get more money um, broadly for external affairs and, and, uh, to, and, and press um, management. And we're, we're slowly getting there. And now we have people on staff who actually, uh, you know, manage our social media accounts and really do try to get ahead of things. Uh, I, I think the, uh, the other big challenge, though, is that there, there is a dwindling number of reporters who really uh, have the, the capacity to take the time to understand this stuff. And, and this is this is complex work that, that we all do um, and finding someone who's, who's willing to listen and, and then be able to articulate that, um, at least in print media, in a way that um, is intelligible to the public. That's that's a that's a vanishing skill um, and a, a, a big challenge as well. Um, sorry, I think we need to, to go on. Um, so one more thanks. And we're going to move to um, uh, Tom Frazier, who is um, unfortunately not joining us in person, but is online. And I'm not quite sure, are we going to get video or just? Oh. Let's start with audio. How's that? Yes, yes. Welcome. Um, right? Yeah, uh, we, we see your slides. Um, OK. Let's shoot. Let me see if I can get a, a video, but it might be just as fine to do this. Let's go. Hold on. And Tom, I don't know if you've, you've been able to hear. We, we're, we're shooting for about 20 minutes with okay. a, with five minutes of, of questions. If we if we stick to that, we'll we'll get done just at at estimated time. Okay, I'll try to keep us on track here. So do you have video now and everything? We do. All right. Well, first of all, I apologize Ooh. for the inconvenience. Um, it was a, it was a long day yesterday. And, and I'm good thing I'm not the chief technology officer because I'm challenged at the moment, but <laughs> hopefully we'll make it work. Um, so again, my name is Tom Fraser. And I am the chief science officer for the state of Florida. And um, for those of you who know me in that room, you know, I spent uh, the first, or I guess the last 30 years of my career uh, in an academic arena, but it's a big change, um, but it's a really exciting uh, time for the change, I guess. 
Uh, we've got an administration in Florida that's super, super um, progressive in my view, you know, and they're ready to address the challenges, the many challenges that we have uh, in the state with regard to water. We've got 22 million people, um, you know, by all accounts, Florida is a water state, but um, because of the, the population, um, the various industries in the state, we've got, you know, one of the largest tourism industries, um, one of the largest agricultural enterprises in the world. Uh, we've, got, we've got water challenges and they're, they're not a secret to anybody. So mm -hmm. we're going to kind of work through some slides. If we can go to the next slide. Okay, I'm going to try to keep pace with these slides. So just give me a sec and then we'll all be on the same page. So uh, we have a new governor, just like California, right? And um, he essentially issued an executive order within uh, the first couple of days of office that um, focused very, very, very squarely on water related issues and water quality in particular. Um, so it was through the legislative budget uh, year, you know, we were fortunate to get more than $625 million um, to address water related issues in the state. And um, I think we're being very aggressive with those dollars, trying to make some progress. Next slide. So in that executive order, I mean, I said there's $625 million. There's certainly additional dollars uh, in the budget for, for other water related issues, but these are the key ones. Um, we've got about $400 million for Everglades restoration. I know Stephanie will be really excited to hear where we're going in that direction. Um, we've got about $100 million for spring uh, restoration uh, as well, $50 million for water quality improvements, $40 million for alternative water supply, and, and another $25 million to deal specifically with some of the harmful algal bloom issues in the state. The, um, I mean, again, for the focus is on water quality and geographically, there's a, a, a large focus on the South Florida ecosystems, particularly Everglades restoration. And to deal with some of <clears throat> the algae blooms that we have in the state, you know, we clearly, um, with regard to uh, climate change and, and sea level rise, Florida, you know, is arguably ground zero for some of those issues. And so that's also a focal area for us. Um, although there's a, a tremendous focus in the South Florida ecosystems, it's not our focus, you know, our, our work isn't completely, you know, narrow in that regard. We've got uh, problems all around the state, particularly in Central and North Florida. And so um, we're dealing with those issues as well. Um, with regard to the, I'm gonna speak to a few of these things in, in, in detail as we move forward, but one of the ones I wanna just talk about now is with regard to alternative water supply. And it's the first time that we've actually had funding for alternative water supply projects since 2008. So it's been more than a decade. And this is super critical for us because um, by 2035, our population is gonna swell to about 25 million and, and our water use is gonna increase by about 20%. So alternative water supply projects that you know are super important to us, and those include things like developing desalination desalinization opportunities. You know how do we deal with brackish and surface and groundwater sources? Um, how do we you know create storage facilities, reclaimed water, um, and stormwater reuse? So all of these things are good. There's there's a lot going on. Next slide. Okay, so I'm gonna go straight to uh, with regard to the big ticket items um, Everglades restoration and you see a couple of bullet points here and I'll just kind of talk about them for those of you that aren't familiar um, <clears throat> we have a lot of water in Florida sometimes not enough water we're trying to get the water in the right places at the right time uh, in South Florida that means that we need a lot of storage um, and we don't have enough at the moment we also need a lot of um, treatment to go with that storage capacity. So part of the goal here moving forward is to uh, acquire some of that storage um, both, both east and west of Lake Okeechobee. Um, we're committed to working with our partners and there's a lot of them in the South Florida system to kind of help uh, rehabilitate the Herbert, uh, Hoover Dyke, which surrounds Lake Okeechobee. Uh, we're trying to focus on uh, kind of renovating or fixing the Tamiami Trail, lifting up the road so we can get more water into 
uh, uh, the National Park and into Biscayne Bay. Um, north of the, the lake, we're trying to uh, finish the Kissimmee River restoration project, uh, also trying to authorize some storage and start a new um, reservoir uh, in the Agri Everglades uh, agricultural area. So what does all this do? Um, I, I think it's, <clears throat> excuse me, um, I think these efforts were going to help improve the health, you know, over of over more than you know two million acres in the South Florida ecosystem, including the parks. I said before, hopefully we'll be able to make some improvements um, in the quality, the water quality in Lake Okeechobee. That's a big concern for everybody in the state. Uh, in order, if we can do that, hopefully we'll be able to reduce some of the discharge, uh, the damaging discharges, you know, both on the east and the west coast of the state. Um, hopefully we'll be able to improve uh, the delivery of water, uh, good clean water to Florida Bay and uh, Biscayne Bay. And again, through these efforts to have some en enhanced water supply and, and maintain our, our flood mitigation efforts, you know, with the Corps. So again, a lot going on. Next slide. Okay. So this is not just a Florida effort. Um, there's, as many people in that room know, there's partners at the federal level uh, and the state level. Those include, you know, uh, Corps of Engineers, uh, Fish and Wildlife Service, USGS, um, you know, National Park Service, and at the state level, Water Management Districts, DEP, uh, Department of Ag, uh, all of the, the, the players that were mentioned similarly in California. Um, but it's, it's a long-term process. And, um, but it's, if you look at this particular uh, slide and you look at the kind of the yellow or the orange on the side, I don't expect you to read that. But what's encouraging about that is we've identified uh, uh, a large number of projects that are uh, intended to, to uh, help with the restoration effort. And if you, what is important about there, when you look at the construction completion dates, a lot of those are to be finished by 2022. So in the very near future, certainly within the term, uh, of this new administration. Next slide. So a couple of those projects that we are receive funding for this year. Um, the first one I would uh, want to talk about is the C44 reservoir and, and the associated stormwater treatment area. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, this reservoir is on the east side of Lake Okeechobee. And again, it's the project is intended to create water storage as well as water treatment. It's currently under, uh, under construction, but um, it's all the contracts have been issued and, and the construction's underway. Um, we do expect this project to be completed by 2022. Um, as, and the state uh, should, expects its part for the stormwater treatment area to be uh, completed before that actually. Uh, the benefits of this particular project is that there's 60, uh, about a little more than 60,000 acre feet of storage. And in the treatment area, you're gonna also remove uh, a little more than 60,000 pounds of, of phosphorus annually. So the total cost of this project is about $750 million. And again, I'm happy to say that the states have uh, already provided their portion of the funds for that. We we'll go to the next slide. So on the other side of Lake Okeechobee, on the west side, we have the C43 reservoir. And so that project is in a construction phase. Um, we expect this contract to be awarded early this year. Uh, the time frame for completion again is 2022. And this reservoir is a bit bigger, it's 170,000 uh, acre feet of storage. Uh, it doesn't um, have the same type of stormwater, or excuse me, um, uh, STA associated with it, but there, um, the way that it's constructed, there will be some phosphorus removal, about close to 20,000 pounds will be removed annually. So the cost of this reservoir is about $600 million. So I, I think people are understanding that the scale of these projects and, and the scale of the in investment is rather large. Next slide. So uh, another project that we received or contributed some funding to is, is Herbert Hoover Dyke. Um, that's the earthen dam that surrounds Lake Okeechobee. And it's anticipated that it uh, will be completed this year, 2019. And um, we hope that it 
you know, the, the restoration, or excuse me, um, the rehabilitation will coincide with the, the revision of the Lake Okeechobee System Operating Manual, which used to be called LORS. So uh, this is a big ticket item, and it's, it's been going for a long time. It's about $1.8 billion, um, but it's fully funded at this point with $100 million in state contributions. So um, again, this is one particular slide um, that, you know, but it's 32 separate structures that needed to be um, uh, visited as part of this restoration effort. So uh, big project. Next slide. So this is one is, is exciting too. Just two weeks ago, uh, the governor announced that full funding had been secured to complete um, the, the project to elevate the Tamiami Trail. And by doing that, we're going to allow essentially, you know, 70, 80, uh, 75 to 80 billion uh, gallons of water a year flow south into the Everglades and down into Florida Bay. So um, uh, that's a, a huge achievement, um, something that's very exciting that just came out of the governor's office in the last couple of weeks. Go to the next slide. And again, just last week, you know, this is even sooner, uh, the South Florida Water Management District, who we work with on a regular basis, um, took the next steps in actually moving the uh, Everglades Agricultural Area Reservoir uh, project forward. So they've submitted applications to the Department of Environmental Protection and the Army Corps um, and for land clearing. And so this project is uh, beginning uh, in relatively short order. Um, <clears throat> the, the intent of the project here again is to not only increase uh, water storage capacity, uh, but improve water quality, again, taking some of the heat or stress off of the estuaries, both to the east and west of Lake Okeechobee. It also allows us an opportunity to send more water south uh, into the Everglades. So it's a big step forward in implementing the governor's executive order and, you know, again, focusing on water quality and kind of just protecting um, our water resources here in the state of Florida. Next slide. Okay, so moving out of the Everglades, uh, I mean, that's an iconic ecosystem, clearly for uh, our nation, but um, North Central Florida is also uh, home to the largest concentration of, of springs, probably, certainly in North America and, and arguably in the world. There's more than 700 of them. Um, and in 2016, the Florida legislature identified 30 outstanding Florida springs. Um, most of these are first magnitude springs that require additional uh, protection, right, to conserve, um, you know, for conservation purposes um, and to ensure that they can be utilized and enjoyed by generations in, in years to come. Uh, so these, the water quality protections that we're moving forward with and are kind of carried out in, in restoration plans that we, we call uh, BMAPs or best uh, uh, basin management action plans. And these particular uh, basin management action plans are focused on reducing nitrogen pollution uh, in our gr groundwater, which ultimately serves as a, a point or a, a source of discharge for these spring systems. And it's uh, presumably uh, the largest culprit affecting water quality in these systems. Um, the sources of nitrogen, you know, they're, they're the usual culprits, right? They can include wastewater, water from septic tanks, stormwater runoff, fertilizer from both urban and agricultural lands. So next slide. Oops. So <clears throat> this is arguably the biggest issue facing Florida right now, and it's the harmful algal blooms. Uh, both blue-green algae blooms in our freshwater systems, uh, particularly in South Florida, and red tides in, in the coastal waters in the Gulf. Um, these aren't unique to Florida. Um, other states in, in the nation and certainly other countries around the world are, are seeing an increase in, in the prevalence of, of blue-green algae blooms. Um, we're trying to, you know, tackle those head-on. Um, we've got, uh, I mean, as part of the governor's executive order, you know, we uh, put together a blue green algae task force and hopefully that'll provide us an opportunity to help set priorities with some of the dollars that we have to spend on, on these algae related problems uh, and also 
importantly, that LG Task Forces provides an opportunity to insert some science into the policy and management arena moving forward. So I'm really excited to be working with that group. One of your um, uh, members, Wendy Graham, happens to be a member of that task force. So um, I, I get to see her on a regular basis. So that's good stuff for me. Um, if we can go to the next slide. Let's see. I heard the folks from California mention, you know, communications is a big issue in messaging and it certainly is here in Florida as well. Um, one of the things in, in my role as Chief Science Officer, I'm actually um, putting together an Office of Environmental Accountability and Transparency. And we are uh, working with a number of consultants to put together um, various uh, websites. This is uh, one of our websites, but it's important for us to be able to um, communicate with the public what, what the, where the problem areas might be, what the level of risk might be, how we're uh, addressing those problems, um, and, and show that we're you know, um, trying to be transparent in what we do and, and responsive to the requests that we get from, from the public. So uh, that's a big issue for us. Next slide. Um, again, with regard to uh, the blue-green algae blooms, most of the problems are in South Florida. Uh, they originate in, in Lake Okeechobee, but I, I want to point out it's not the only place that we have blue-green algae blooms. We have uh, blue-green algae blooms um, in some of these spring systems. We certainly have blue-green algae blooms in uh, the St. John Rivers on the northeast coast and in other water bodies throughout the state. But for right now, uh, a large you know, lens is on the, the South Florida ecosystems and the way that we're dealing with them. Again, uh, some of the, the driving forces of the, uh, these algae blooms are not um, unexpectedly are, are, are nutrient driven. So we're, we're trying to work on these problems through the basin uh, management action plans. And we have three of them that are, are key right now. One of them is the Lake Okeechobee beam map, uh, which you see in green on that slide. The other two are uh, the coastal um, basin management action plans, one for the Caloosahatchee on the west coast and the St. Lucie River and Estuary on the east coast. Uh, as part of that, um, <clears throat> part of our efforts, I guess, are trying to uh, review and, and update these B maps. And by the end of this year, uh, I think we're on a good uh, pace to do that, uh, both for the Caloosahatchee and St. Lucie and Lake Okeechobee is expected to be finished later uh, certainly before December 2019. We use uh, the BMAPs to, to prioritize the types of projects that we're going to invest in that'll hopefully allow us to get the most bang for our buck with regard to nutrient reduction uh, efforts. And again, the, the Blue Green Algae Task Force is going to be invaluable in that regard, helping us think, uh, use science to make the best decisions in the, as we can with regard to those prioritization processes. Next slide. Oops. So, um, you know, it, it seems like this is an important point to make. I mean, the, the nutrient algae problems are, they're big problems and they're not going to go away tomorrow. Um, we realize that you have to kind of keep your eye on the prize and we have to, to continue to implement uh, a wide variety of projects uh, to, to get the nutrient loading down. Um, but that's, again, we realize it's going to take many, many years to do that. Um, but we're going to try to complement that long-term uh, approach with uh, a relatively um, more aggressive intervention strategy. So we have dollars in our budget to uh, employ innovative technologies, and we're actively seeking, uh, uh, you know, very creative solutions, not only to a deal with the potential problem right up front. You know, how do we, um, how do we use technologies to reduce nutrients before they get uh, to cause a problem? How do we new, use technologies uh, to contain blooms? Um, or how do we use those type of technologies or innovative technologies to um, uh, contain them or, or mitigate the damage that they might have caused? So uh, this is just an example here. We have lots of canals um, in our South Florida ecosystems and um, they can cause lots of problems, right? Not just uh, nuisance uh, odors, they can be uh, toxic, as most people know. 
that's becoming a, a bigger issue and we have to coordinate obviously with the Department of Health um, and our other agencies in the state like the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, not only to address, address those problems, but to uh, message them uh, effectively, right? So next slide. So um, kind of moving out of the, the obvious water quality arena, uh, we, there is a big focus again on, on coastal resilience. Uh, as I said before, Florida's ground zero for sea level rise. We know that, right? And I think the Florida Department of Environmental Protection is committed to kind of marshalling the resources that we need uh, to prepare Florida's coastal communities um, to, to deal with the effects of climate change. Um, we're in the process now of hiring uh, a new chief resilience officer uh, to deal with some of these issues, but they're, they're complex and, and multifaceted. There are certainly impacts of sea level rise that require uh, modifications of, of the built environment, uh, modifications of infrastructure, but clearly there's impacts on, on natural systems. And in the Department of Environmental Protection, we're uh, keenly aware of that. Um, we have uh, you know, an Office of Resilience and, and uh, Coastal Protection that manages more than 4.5 million acres of submerged lands. And the focus in that regard, I guess, is really on the structural habitats. You know, those are things like coral reefs, seagrasses, oysters, marsh and mangrove systems that provide a barrier of defense against um, uh, storm uh, surges and, and things of that nature. So as many people are aware, um, also uh, in the Florida Keys, we have the only barrier reef system in, in North America. Um, and or in the U.S., it's uh, it's it's in a degraded state, and, and we're trying to fix that right now, in large part because uh, there's water quality issues that we have to deal with and disease issues. But we're focused on that. And again, in the executive order, it wasn't all about lakes and, and harmful algae blooms. Uh, we've allocated several million dollars to deal with coral restoration um, and remediation efforts there as well. So a lot going on. It's a good time. Um, if we go to the next slide. Maybe, um, oh, we are done. Okay, excellent. So, yeah, I'm good. Is that, are we on schedule? Spot on, yes. Thank you very much. Perfect. All right. Great, uh, so yeah. <laughs> yeah, thanks a lot. I think we have time for uh, a question or two. Okay. And Nusha is quick to the draw again. Man, she's good. <laughs> no, that's <laughs> okay. like waiting. No, 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 please go. Go ahead. <laughs> um, Tom, thank you so much for your presentation. I, uh, uh, I have sort of a two question for you. One is, I didn't hear anything uh, about water use, um, uh, sort of control or conservation and efficiency in your. Um, uh, in your sort of alternative water supply strategies, uh, which made me um, wonder if, I know there's some efforts going on, but I wonder how much uh, emphasis is put on that before building all sort of engineered solutions. Uh, the second was, uh, as you talk about coastal resiliency, obviously, uh, as you know, uh, there's so much opportunity in these multi-benefit solutions that can deal with water quality and coastal resiliency and potentially some water supply in a sense that the less um, uh, seawater intrusion you have, the more water you have to use. Um, also, some of that can help with, um, uh, you know, some stuff like horizontal levees and uh, some of those solutions that can have multi-benefits. I wonder if you can touch on those two issues a little bit. Yeah, so, I mean, again, um, there's so many things that we have to deal with in Florida with regard to water and I was trying to keep it to 15 minutes and you know and try to emphasize and, um, and focus on some of the things that are priorities I mean obvious priorities for us in, in a very very short term but it doesn't mean that we've neglected alternative water supply it's, it's a big issue for us right um, particularly with regard to conservation um, uh, and reuse types of things but um, it's uh, there often some challenges there, right? And sometimes when uh, there are, I guess, competing issues, you know, sometimes you, when you conserve water, 
Sometimes you concentrate uh, potential pollutants and you have to be careful where that water goes um, or you might exacerbate a water quality problem. So those are things that we're learning to deal with. Um, and, but again, I, don't, I think that alternative water supply is certainly on our radar. And as I said before, there's all kinds of opportunities to pay attention to and, and we're doing that. And so I, I, just, I don't want you to think that we're ignoring that. And with regard to the coastal resiliency question, um, same type of thing. You know, all of the efforts to improve water quality um, will ultimately, um, hopefully, yield some benefits for those uh, habitats that are offshore that uh, provide tremendous ecosystem services, uh, particularly with regard to uh, things like you know, uh, dealing or combating sea level rise or or more intense. Uh, uh, <coughs> Uh, storms or an increased frequency of storms. So um, you're you're right on both accounts. I mean, they're part of our portfolio of things, um, and we're we're not ignoring them. They're they're everywhere. Great, thank you very much. Um, I think we need to move on to the next speaker. We started in California. We are in Florida, and now we move to the uh, local area, the to Maryland state. Of Maryland, great thank state you, of Maryland. <laughs> I think I had the best commute of all the speakers. So <laughs> sorry, guys. Um, good morning. My name is Suzanne Dorsey. I'm the Assistant Secretary at Maryland Department of the Environment, and on behalf of Ben Grub Grumbles, our secretary, um, thank you. It's it's such a privilege to be here. I I am the token scientist in the office of the secretary. Um, you know, my background really started out with sort of biophysical coupling. Um, and um, my career has spanned uh, coastal North Carolina down into the Caribbean um, and offshore, a lot of oceanography work. But um, I've always been fascinated about um, why, or maybe why, more importantly, why not? Why don't decision makers use science to address their problems? And um, so that's been sort of a key theme of, of my career is, well, we've got these great USGS pro, uh, problem, uh, programs and, and NOAA programs, um, increasingly sophisticated scientific tools, and yet some of us are still working on outdated decision frameworks that are based on competing needs, who you know, where the money is, who's, uh, who's in the administration. Um, it's frustrating. So. As I looked at what the goals of, of this workshop was, um, you know, really trying to use these tools, you know, doing the good work of science, bringing sophisticated tools to the decision-making framework, I thought I would sort of try to give you three take-home observations that I have, three take-home needs. Um, and I think each one, none of them are unique. I think that we've touched on each of them, and I suspect they'll, they'll come up again and again. again. But, um, you know, at the Maryland Department of the Environment, we have a mission to protect and restore the environment for the health and well-being of all Marylanders. And really, we work in a lar lo larger framework. We're a small state, um, but we work collaboratively with our neighbors in a lot of areas. As I work in the state of Maryland, I've, I find that there's three key areas that we need support. Um, one is the analysis of risk a really excellent vulnerability index and really educating decision makers about what risk management is and what risk analysis is and honestly what it's not and understanding the difference between that black swan event in addition to the high risk, high probability vulnerability areas that really need to be assessed. Um, that needs to be, in, and you're gonna hear this word a lot, that needs to be integrated. So it can't just be one dimensional. It can't just be water supply. We don't look at things in a one dimensional framework anymore. So the second area, the second theme that I really wanna emphasize is decision framework. Again, objective data-driven decision <laughs> framework. I live in, in the city of Annapolis and um, historic place. My family goes back uh, 13 generations there. Um, it's deep, deeply meaningful if you're from Maryland, even if you're from the United States, has important historic relevance. We have the Naval Academy there. Um, we have coastal flooding, right? Sea level rise, we have coastal flooding, almost monthly coastal flooding. So the long-term plans for the city of Annapolis is, well, we're gonna put up a seawall. Okay, that's fair. It's a reasonable approach. 
except for that the Naval Academy, DOD, is putting up a three-foot seawall, and the city of Annapolis wants to put up a four-foot wall. What are you talking about? <laughs> it's competing needs. Well, the Navy isn't going to talk to the city, and the city isn't, even if they talk to each other, we're going to do what we're going to do. So how do we help these communities make good decisions? Let's have a framework for decision-making. A lot of our local, even our state agencies, don't have excellent decision-making tools. Finally, we're talking multi-billion dollar investment, particularly when it comes to infrastructure change. And, and you've seen multi-million dollars of investments here. We're talking, um, Governor po Hogan has put five billion just in our Chesapeake Bay restoration program. If we are investing multi-billion dollars, we need multiple benefits. We cannot just focus on water supply, water quality. It's gotta be storm management, flood mitigation, it's got to be all of the above. So I'm, I'm a child of, of the space race. Um, my dad was an aeronautical engineer. So think about Sputnik. We invested, the Russians invested a lot of money, did one thing, I think it beeped, right? Which is impressive. I mean, it was impressive. Now the ISS. It doesn't do one thing. It does multiple things. We've got to think about, we need solutions and we need scientists to integrate solutions to optimize outcomes. It can't be one thing. It must be multiple things. So those are my take home messages from Sputnik to the ISS. We've got to be thinking about how we make wise investments with public funds. So I'll give you a couple of frames. First of all, in Maryland, almost everything we do at the, at the department in the state is framed by um, two driving issues, the Chesapeake Bay Restoration Program. I couldn't be prouder. I left the state 25 some years ago. Um, I work working in the Bay, spending 48 hour cruises in the Chesapeake Bay, pulling up 300 gallons of jellyfish, looking at how uh, uh, they impacted fisheries. Um, the Bay was in decline, massive dead zones. Uh, we had switched from a keystone species of the oysters to, to these jellyfish species. I come back, the Bay has turned a corner. Now, all of my good technical people in the Chesapeake Bay region, y'all don't take a minute to realize the incredible success that defines the Chesapeake Bay Restoration Program. We've had more SAV restoration in the state. We've had fewer dead zones. I think we're predicted to have a pretty big one this year because of all the rainfall. But a couple of years back, we had zero dead zones more fish, more crabs, all of our indication, indicators are showing recovery. So we may be reaching a stable state which allows us to manage and ensure that this bay continues to recover and be healthy and vibrant and add to our economy. It's incredible. How do we get there? Of course, a foundation of science. Incredible. I sat in science and technical advisory uh, committees incredible mental intellectual resources have driven tools that we implement to clean up the Chesapeake Bay. But the real innovation, I'm sorry, I'm a scientist, I'm sorry to say this. Again, how do we make decisions? How do we get things done? The real innovation, human to human connectivity, the complex, messy, dynamic challenge of maintaining relations. This is a multi-jurisdictional effort from New York to Virginia we are all trying to work together with the support of the EPA, a federal agency, to help us enforce a total maximum daily load and clean up our streams and our byways. When you go to Western Maryland or West Virginia or Pennsylvania, they don't care about the Chesapeake Bay. I might, I live there. But folks in Western Maryland need to have a rationale for supporting the Chesapeake Bay. You need to talk to them as human beings and ask them what matters to them. Stream temperature matters to them. Making sure that the trout population is restoring and that they can have a green economy, that matters. That's the decision frame for them. Flooding matters to them. So how do you solve those problems that are locally relevant and get a clean bay out of it as a co-benefit? So again, having the a focus, not just on a one dimensional challenge, but really looking at it from the local relevance, local priorities, scaling up to the impact on the Chesapeake Bay, that integrated approach is what we need. That's what we've been successful with. And then managing those relationships. There are some communities that are don't tread on me communities. 
They, they don't like the state government. They definitely don't like the federal government. But often they have local problems that can be resolved and access to federal or state funds is a benefit. So let's say you've got a church parking lot that floods all the time and we can help restore that creek and address that flooding issue. So how do you work with that group to make that a reality? Sometimes we don't talk about the Chesapeake Bay. We don't talk necessarily, we work with local staff members. So those relationships, again, I can't emphasize enough. So the other frame that really defines a lot of what we do in the state of Maryland, particularly at Maryland Department of the Environment, is our secretary is the chair of the Maryland Climate Commission. And we have some ambitious goals. In 2009, we adopted the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Act. Um, California, I'm sure it's not as impressive as yours, but also very regional. We are not big enough to do anything alone. So there are a lot of regional connect, collect, uh, connections here. So in 2015, the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Plan update found that like California, we're on target to meet you know, our emissions reduction. Um, we've estimated an economic benefit of between 2.5 and $3.5 billion by 2020. Um, we've created between 26 and 33,000 new jobs in our little tiny state. So again, this green investment has is measured in terms of dollars and jobs. Why? That's what decision makers care about. Um, in 2015, Governor Hogan signed an updated uh, version and increasing a, a benchmark requiring a 40% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions from to the 2006 uh, level by 2030. So we can't just focus on the Chesapeake Bay. We can't just focus on local flooding. We've got to integrate all of these. So we, looking forward, integration is a key part. So we do look at water in MDE as a one water integrated approach. Um, but we've really got to think about where the decisions are made that are most influential. So when I came to Maryland, one of the questions I had was saltwater intrusion. I was working with the agricultural um, groups and I saw some of our NGOs saying, what is the impact of agricultural irrigation on saltwater intrusion in the state of Maryland? And I said, that's a great question, but it's, you're not finished. What about residential use and what about industrial use? No, no, we don't care about that. We want to know what ag, big bad ag is doing to our aquifers. You're setting up a dispute there. And what I know with saltwater intrusion is that the solution is integrated. It involves water conservation in industry. It involves potentially ag taking high uh, quality waste treated wastewater and using that for irrigation. So if we pit these entities against each other, we're going to fail. Immediately, we're going to fail. And that's a long term failure because as soon as those relationships are, you know, uh, set up in a negative standpoint, it's really hard to get folks back together again. So according to a draft saltwater intrusion plan, we don't know really what saltwater intrusion is in the state of Maryland. We know about inundation. We know we're going to lose 20,000 acres of, of farmland and forest land on the eastern shore of Maryland but we don't really know what the state of our aquifers are. Um, so we, we're lacking a comprehensive plan for saltwater intrusion. Um, we know that our nutrient management plans for all of our farmers, we have some of the most, um, most impressive farming farmers in the nation. Proportion, we don't have the most farmers, let me be clear. But proportionately, more of our farmers practice conservation farming. That is, they use cover crops, they use no-till. They're very focused on nutrient management. And they have more best management practices impl implemented than anywhere else in the nation and than more place, most places in the world. So our farmers um, are required to meet very strict nutrient management plans. You put salt in that groundwater and it changes everything. The chemistry shifts radically. So we need an integrated plan that considers how saltwater intrusion it affects the water quality, but also our nutrient management strategy. Can't just be one. 
So we need an analysis of the risk, a decision framework. Hey, let's not just attack this with ag. Let's make sure we bring in our business partners. Let's bring in the state and the residential water use and make sure that we have an integrated approach, an approach that really involves both or all three sectors and ask them to step up to the plate and work collaboratively. What I need from science is that integrated, optimized solution, a focus on the solution. We'll get the relationships, but we need a focus on that optimized solution. And it needs to expand outside of just physical science or, or chemistry. You know, like those of us that are working in the decision framework, I think science really needs to think about how all of these different uh, uh, economic inputs, demographic inputs, equity, all the things that you've heard, you've got to be thinking about that in terms of your hard science as well. So, um, uh, there's a lot of questions with with our saltwater intrusion. The, the good news is I think Texas and California, Louisiana, y'all are way, way ahead of us. The solutions are out there. Figuring out how to optimize those solutions for the state of Maryland with our other priorities, that's what we need support from. That's where we need help. So the next issue I want to talk about, I'm trying to keep us on time here, is stormwater management. So stormwater management is another area. The Chesapeake Bay program, we got a, we get a lot of criticism based around the fact that we do annual practices to address our nutrient management. So our environmental critiques, and they're right, we solve a lot of nutrient management problems with annual practices, our cover crop pro practice is an annual practice. It sucks up the extra excess nitrogen from our fields every winter. It's very successful. Relatively speaking, in the context of nutrient management, it's extremely cheap. We invest in it more than any other state in the nation, and it works. But it's not permanent. If we pull that money, that benefit goes away. So there's a lot of push to invest in large scale infrastructure changes. Remember, most of our infrastructure was built way before we had stormwater management regulation. So what do we do? How do we address this? We need you know, hundreds of millions of dollars worth of infrastructure change. It cannot be Sputnik. It cannot just be around water quality management. It has to be based around some of our climate change goals. It has to be based around uh, human safety, well, uh, high capacity, well building, housing, social equity. It's got to be optimized for multiple benefits. And we need you to help us really think about that from a systems perspective. Our regulators work in a very na narrow frame. It is difficult for them to think about things outside of their frame. So how do we help craft solutions that get us to a place where multi-billion dollar investments, let's say in the city of Baltimore, make sense? How do we not only deal with our nutrients, but also bring in our toxins? It's got to be both, and it's got to be at the same time. And if we're going to invest in large-scale infrastructure, we need the International Space Station. We need it to do more than one thing. So we expect to spend, and, and the stormwater management is really interesting. We, we basically ask all of our high density areas to, re, to get rid of impervious surface, to restore impervious surface, 20%. We've invested, um, our permittees have invested $1.5 billion so far to restore impervious surface. It's one thing, right? There's several different practices that get us there, stream management, but there's also annual practice. We do street sweeping in Baltimore. And if you've been to Baltimore recently, we're happy about them doing street sweeping. It's about all they can manage. Um, are we on the right track? Are we spending our money in this restoration of impervious surface on the right areas? Is there a better way that we can get to where we want to be with flood mitigation, nutrient management, spend our resources more wisely? Where should we do stream restoration? Looks like the headwaters is a much better investment than farther down. 
So those are questions that a lot that are we're seeking to optimize the outcomes, to manage multiple benefits. So I'll, I'll end where I started that we need this vulnerability index to say, hey, you better start here. Um, we need to get out of our framework of competing needs and competing power structures and really focus our decision matrix on areas that represent the highest risk to the well-being, the lifestyle, the economic viability of our, of our state. Um, we need to make sure that if we invest in large-scale infrastructure that we have access to amenities, improved access to um, reasonable housing, and improved water quality um, and water and managing water quantity. We need to decrease the nutrients getting to the bay. We need to decrease our sediments getting to the bay. We need to decrease the risk of life. I don't know if those of you that are from this area will know that Ellicott City is a, a little mill town just nestled in between toward, sort of a high topography area that's been highly developed. And they had 2000 year floods within two years. Um, I recently was at a meeting where a scientist came in and said, you know, we've reanalyzed the risk, for, um, the risk um, for Ellicott City to flood. And instead of a thousand year, those floods are, are no longer thousand year floods. They're 132 year floods. That doesn't mean anything to our decision makers. How you phrase that is critical to what decisions are made. We're starting to get a handle in the state of Maryland that post-crisis um, planning is generally very poor planning. If you look at Ellicott City, what is it, 1.2 billion, I think we are, to fix the problem. If we had fixed it before mm -hmm. with managing our development, it would have been a lot cheaper. So we're starting to get a handle on what these things mean. But as a scientific community, don't talk to my treasurer about 132 year risk. It doesn't mean anything to her. Talk about vulnerability priorities. Do not come to state government with a 42 lit priority list, 42 you know, issues that need to be addressed. Can't take that all in. Start with at the top three, start working your way down. <laughs> So think about how human beings make decisions. Understand that it is the complexity of those relationships, those relationships that form and break and reform. Um, generally, the bluntest tools that, that governments have are litigation and um, regulation. They tend to hurt relationships but rather than help relationships. But how can we build relationships and, and find solutions that address multiple issues? So hopefully I didn't take too long. I'm try I tried to scale it down a little bit, but I'm happy to take questions if we have time. Thank you very much. So I think we do have time for one, maybe two questions. All right. Keep us on track. All right. Everyone's getting hungry, I think. Uh, John, we uh, now circle back to the great state of Texas. Okay. All right, so I'm in the unenviable position of standing between you and lunch, so I'll keep us moving right along. <clears throat> so when I, I got the call to give this talk, I'm a geologist, and right now our, our agency is consumed with the new initiative to set up a statewide flood planning process, including an appropriations of $1.6 billion. And so when I, I took this job, we were primarily water supply planners planning for drought or record. And so my, my talk is going to be in the context of water supply projects, but since then, excuse the pun, we've been inundated with working on these flood issues. I know, apologies for that. Um, but that's been our primary focus is working on flood issues. As a geologist, I don't get to talk about groundwater anymore, so I'm really excited to be able to give you this talk and focus in on some of the, the future groundwater challenges that are uh, facing my state. And so when I thought about how to organize this talk, <clears throat> excuse me, um, I, it was so daunting to try to condense it all down into a digestible form. So my geology brain kicked in. I said, let's just walk through it stratigraphically. And so, yes, uh, in fact, this is how I've organized this. And is it, how do I drive? Okay, there it is. Yeah, stratigraphically, we'll walk through some of the issues starting at the shallow subsurface, move all the way down to depth. 
I'm going to give you a quick overview so you understand sort of the groundwater situation in Texas and uh, some of the terms because I'm going to refer to them. Also move down into the uh, uh, problem of surface groundwater interaction. Move further down into the uh, freshwater aquifers and their diminishing availability over time. And then to look at the prospect of the brackish aquifers as a future water supply source for our state. And then look at the problem of deep water, uh, deep uh, well injection of produced water from the oil and gas industry and how that interfaces which to the, with these brackish waters. A real challenge for us. So just quick, give you a quick overview. <clears throat> We're blessed with tremendous groundwater resources in Texas. Nine major aquifers here on the left, 22 minor aquifers on the right. All total about 12 million acre feet of water available from these aquifer systems. So and in terms of the use of groundwater in Texas, it's the dominant source of supply at present with over 60% of all water being supplied by groundwater. And then the real dominant user here is the agricultural industry, which uses 75% uh, uh, of that water. And it's primarily in these blue counties. Um, this is where the dominant groundwater counties, and this is where all the irrigated agriculture is, principally up here in the high plains in Texas, and then also uh, out here in the, the hinterlands of, of Texas. So uh, really important for, for agricultural purposes. Uh, most of the state relies on surface water for public water supply, but 28% is, is provided for that. Interesting statistic, though, is 99% of all rural um, uh, citizens rely on groundwater for their, their supply. So if you live away from a utility, it's likely you have a private well as your, as your principal source of groundwater or of, of water. Okay, a little bit about um, the Texas water law. We're unique in a lot of ways in that we, uh, our fundamental um, doctrine, water doctrine is the rule of capture. This is established by a court case, common law, case back in 1904 where a landowner was adjacent to um, uh, next to a railroad company that drilled a big well and effectively that well drained his well from pumping. It was taken all the way up through the courts and the courts in their infinite wisdom concluded uh, at the bottom that uh, basically this is paraphrasing here that groundwater is so secret, occult and concealed that it's practically impossible to manage. So they kind of just threw their hands up there. Um, also, in another quote, this is more recent. There's a great book by a Seamus McGraw called Thirsty Land. It's all about Texas water and our, some of our challenges. But this is a quote from one of the attorneys. This is another summary of Texas water law. Uh, if I'm pumping it, it's mine. If you're pumping it, it's ours. And if it's polluted, well, then it's yours. And that's, that's kind of it in a nutshell. But rule of capture is certainly consistent with the first one. It really is pump as much as you want with little consequence, provided it's not malicious causes subsidence or it's wasteful. <clears throat> so that is the law of the land, but the rural capture has been modified with established of local uh, controlled districts, groundwater conservation districts. Where there is a groundwater conservation district, they have the ability to impose uh, curtailments, um, pumping restrictions, well spacing, they can manage groundwater. So we've evolved away from groundwater, from rural capture, where you have if you're a part of this crazy, crazy quilt of districts that it currently exists in the state. So it's a decentralized uh, method of management is established by statute as the preferred method of management. And it is the only means of modifying the rural capture in Texas. So I also want to talk a little bit about the, uh, the groundwater planning process. You notice that all these districts are spread out across the entire state. They don't align with the, uh, uh, the offer that generally shaped like a county. To sort of reconcile that separation, we've created these groundwater management areas in which all the districts located within one of these 16 groundwater management areas has to collectively get together and decide what is their future policy? What are they going to collectively manage towards by determining what's called a desired future condition? I'm going to refer back to this later. And this sets a quantifiable condition of the aquifer that they all intend to manage towards. And so in a, a shotgun wedding of policy and science, that uh that policy statement is handed to our agency and we apply our groundwater availability models to determine how much pumping could be afforded to preserve that condition so this is effectively the means of determining availability and within uh my agency we own and operate all the groundwater availability models we maintain them and we uh, maintain them for this specific purpose of uh, supporting this process and ultimately um, that availability number gets fed up into the state water plan into the districts where they use to manage. So all that is just context <clears throat> to set up these challenges I want to describe to you. And we'll start 
here in the, the uh, shallow subsurface with the interaction of uh, surface and groundwater. So excuse this cu uh, crude cartoon here, but it describes it pretty well. It's the only one I could find, but it really shapes up what's going on the circumstance. Because here in Texas, another kooky aspect of our law is that we bifurcated the waters. Surface water in the state of Texas is considered public water. Uh, water managed by the state, you have to go to a centralized agency, TCQ, to get a water rights for diversion of surface water supplies. Groundwater, on the other hand, is managed decentrally by the local districts and is considered private property. So very different things. We've ta taken the hydrogeologic cycle and we've severed it, we've bifurcated it, and we've created this circumstance where this interface right here is this unknown place. We don't know what to deal, uh, how to deal with it. And we're not sure what to do when you get uh, an induced flow coming from pumping just adjacent to a river system. It's creating a real problem for us and it's gonna to continue to be a struggle. Um, oftentimes our agency is called on to help inform this problem. Here a few years ago, statute uh, legislation was passed that tasked our agency with conducting a study of all the aquifers in Texas and quantifying what the volume was that, uh, of the surface water streams that had, were sourced from groundwater. Um, and likewise, how much of the, uh, the surface water streams were contributing or how many, uh, what proportion of the aquifers were contributing to surface water. We conducted that study. We, we literally had about six months to do it. So we had to do, look at it from a real high level view, but we're able to look at, uh, take the USGS, thank you, uh, base flow indices, and uh, apply that to the reaches of the stream that cross over the outcrop of the aquifers and then come up with an estimate of how much of the uh, water was being contributed by the, by the aquifers. And so here are the results. I mean, the takeaway here is that all the river systems uh, owe their, their uh, the supplies to some, on some level to groundwater. And uh, here are the ranges. On average, it's about of 30% of all surface water is sourced from groundwater. So it's what we already, sort of new, we were just able to quantify it in some sense, that this is an interactive system and to separate them legally has created some real complications. And so some actual on the ground problems are starting to emerge where you have some river systems that have uh, substantial groundwater development in the alluvium adjacent to them that are starting to impact water rights downstream. And in particular, the San Saba River, this is normally a perennially flowing river um, before this wet stage that we've experienced since about two, 2015, we were into an extreme drought period. And this was this part of the river that had never gone dry before was dry. And uh, the downstream interests that were relying on these, these water rights were pointing to the upstream agricultural community. And in fact, there'd been a lot of well development in the area. But again, we weren't real sure what to call it, surface water, groundwater, how to reconcile it. Good news is it rained and we went on, we uh, started thinking about something else for a little while. Um, this is also a problem down here <clears throat> in Val Verde County. This is the Devil's River, beautiful river system out there in the wilds of Texas. Um, it's all sourced completely by groundwater. I'm gonna, this is gonna be my case study for the, this afternoon. It's fascinating, uh, complicated hydrology and hydrogeology, but this is also a, a problem in terms of groundwater affecting surface water flows out there. So the challenges, again, we've got that poorly defined interface of surface water and groundwater. Um, as a, a policy goal, most of the offers have to accept some sort of level of managed decline over time. So with managed decline, you're gonna have, you're gonna further uh, impact the base flows to these surface streams. It's also gonna affect some of our environmental flow standards that we've established for the state, and in some cases, endangered species habitat for uh, uh, water dependent species. So the solutions, I mentioned we have groundwater availability models at my agency. They were, they're, they're regional models to, used to determine availability. They're not fine enough scale to be able to measure or simulate what happens at that interface, that really shallow interface. So they're too coarse for that, um, which is a problem. In terms of solutions, science, we need more of it. Uh, we need more data, we need more technical tools to really inform the issue. Um, and particularly we need to reduce the vertical resolution of these GAMs to really be able to measure that interface. More field data, ideally from co-located monitor wells and stream gauges so that we can correlate those relationships. And then we need a better quantify bank storage. We know we can calculate rainfall runoff, we can calculate contributions to base flow from aquifers. We don't really have a good sense of what that bank storage is. Okay, moving on into the subsurface, I'm gonna talk about the freshwater aquifers in Texas. 
So this is a graph from our state water plan that shows uh, the future availability over a 50 year period of groundwater in terms of providing our long term supply. I mentioned that we're at about 12 million acre feet um, of available supply at present. Most of that is coming from half of it is coming from the High Plains Ogallala Aquifer System and then the Gulf Coastal Aquifer System. As a practical matter, High Plains doesn't really recharge much. So all the irrigated agriculture is effectively mining, slowly mining that aquifer over time, such that they've had to accept managed depletion as a, uh, as a management strategy. So those supplies are gonna diminish over time. And over here, overproduction has caused a substantial subsidence problem. So they've really had to cut back on production to make sure to mitigate for subsidence. All in all, that creates about a 24% decline in available water supplies over the 50 year horizon. So that's, that's a, a real issue. And just to illustrate this to you, I mentioned desired future condi conditions or DFCs, that's these policy goals. I wanted to plot up a couple of them just to illustrate that in fact, most of these aquifers are managed for some level of acceptable decline. This is a Creso aquifer system. It's a deeply confined unit. So this is principally uh, reductions in artesian pressure, but up to upwards of 100 feet over 50 years is what they've accepted that they have to manage towards. Then up here, this is a uh, unconfined aquifer system, but again, doesn't recharge much. So managed decline or some percent of saturated th thickness remaining over time is the policy goal. So what do we do? Um, how do we replace this diminishing supply over time? This is a pie chart of, of the current state water plan and all the strategies that we have in place to provide for that 50 year demand. Where as of now, brackish groundwater desalination is really only a very small component of that. But we've been doing a lot of work on characterizing these aquifers and we f I feel like it's got a much more potential. So let's move down into the brackish. So we keep going down, there's a trend here. Um, we're moving down into the brackish aquifers to talk about the availability uh, of that as a future water supply. Uh, back in 2003, we um, conducted an estimate of the overall supplies uh, or overall water, uh, brackish groundwater within Texas. We estimated 2.7 billion acre feet of brackish groundwater. Now compare that to available uh, freshwater supplies of about 12 million acre feet. So a tremendous resource and potential here. And um, we're really focusing in on this zone here between 1,000 and 10,000 TDS. We feel like that that's the sort of the low hanging fruit the next level in terms of where future supplies can come from. Um, within our agency, right after the study came out, we were appropriated funding to set up a program called the BRACS program, Brackish Resource Aquifer Characteriz Characterization System, that was really focusing on two things, characterizing broadly uh, the extent of these brackish groundwater resources, and these are some of the studies that we've completed. But then also we've been tasked more recently to narrow in on what are called brackish groundwater production zones. And the, the statute established certain criteria to where we're to designate what I call the sweet spots, zones within those aquifers that the highest potential for future supply and the lowest risk of negative impacts. So we've, we've uh, conducted studies on about uh, eight of those aquifers and designated zones, and they're very, very limited. I'm gonna focus in on the Creso and the Gulf Coast aquifer system. Of these entire systems, these are the only areas that we were able to designate zones, and, and here's why. This last criteria, which is intended to avoid any negative impacts, it precludes us from designating a zone where you have wastewater injection, particularly from oil and gas waste. If you know anything about Texas, we've got a, the oil and gas industry is booming. It has been uh, for 100 years or more. And so this is creating a real problem that we really didn't realize until we dug into this. And so what we were hoping to find is that if we narrowed in on this zone, 3,000 to 10,000, what the EPA designates as a USDW, underground source of drinking water, that that would be the sweet spot and the injection would be limited to these lower zones of higher salinity. What we're actually finding, and this is a, a couple of figures from some of our Brax reports, that historical wastewater disposal has actually been injecting into these USDWs or just below them, such uh, in areas where there's not enough hydrogeological separation to prevent upward movement of that injectate. And so, We've uh, conservatively buffered all these old injection wells. These are all one, three to 10,000 TDS USDWs, but we conservatively buffered them with the 15 mile buffers to make sure that projects don't go in with the potential of producing injectate over time. And it really limits dramatically the production potential from these aquifers. This is the Carrizo Wilcox. It sits right underneath the Eagle Ford Shale play. 
um, or sorry, a top it, um, which is a really productive area within Texas. And this is the Gulf Coast aquifer system. And you can also see where we've had to buffer all these injections wells. So, so substantially, potentially limits that, that resource. And then finally, <clears throat> that's the limits of the existing injection wells. Going forward, what concerns me is if we're looking to these brackish resource, brackish aquifers for a future water supply, the, uh, the amount of oil and gas production is really just ramping up. It's a tremendous amount of current production. Uh, U.S. is the world leader in oil and gas production. Texas uh, produces about 40% of the U.S.'s um, supply of oil and gas. And namely out here in the Midland, the Permian Basin, uh, the Barnett Shale, and then the Eagle Ford Shale, with the development of these unconventional reservoirs, uh, estimates are is that we're producing about 10 barrels of produced water for every barrel of oil. What are you going to do with all this water? It's a tremendous challenge and a big problem. Right now, the cheapest source is the way to do it is to inject it into the ground. So the problem, excuse my crude cartoon here, but here's the problem is that if you inject too deep, get close to the basement rocks, and Oklahoma's experienced this, you have induced seismicity. If you come up a little shallower, where well, you're coming up against these brackish water resources that could potentially be future supply. This is what keeps me up at night. How are we going to manage this amount of water? One solution is to reuse it all for hydrologic fracking demand, but some estimates coming out of the Delaware Basin <clears throat> is that there's a four to one ratio of uh, uh, produced water versus demand. So even if you used all of it, you still have a tremendous amount of water they got to deal with. So it's a challenge or an opportunity. This is really high saline stuff, by the way, some of it 100,000 TDS with all the other constituents. Is it cost effective to treat it and reuse it? Right now it's not, um, but if we're gonna continue to develop the energy sector out here, that's gonna be a real challenge. I think I've probably already gone too long, so I'll just sum up here. Um, future challenges, trying to navigate and reconcile that legal separation between surface water and groundwater. Um, our freshwater aquifers are completely subscribed, so how do we reconcile our future water supply issues? I think brackish aquifers are really the key. However, there's a real potential that we're compromising some of that resource with um, this issue of how we manage produce water over time. So that's all I have. I'll uh, try to answer any questions. You have any? Everybody hungry? Excellent. Well, we definitely have some time for questions. Uh, oh. Kay, was there? Oh, I'm sorry. <clears throat> uh, the Water Science and Technology Board's been involved. With, uh, WSTB's been involved in a series of studies uh, for the, uh, in providing advice for the Ed Edwards Aquifer uh, District. Uh, how um, <clears throat> unusual is that kind of, that level of organization and uh, collaboration among the various aquifer districts that you had on your map up there? Is that something that's growing, that kind of cooperation, collaboration? Well, to be honest, it's been forced upon them um, because we've got these groundwater management areas that I showed you, the 16. Those groundwater management areas are configured like the major aquifer systems, so they have to come together and decide collectively on what their common goals are to be. And so there's more pressure from the legislature to better align how they manage, to create more regulatory certainty. Anytime there's any sort of disparate management or disparate management approach among adjacent districts, they're really feeling a lot of pressure to get those aligned. So uh, I, you're seeing more cooperation and the districts are ahead of it, they know it. You know, they're going to be compelled to do that, but mo much of it is happening on a voluntary basis. Great, Kay, go ahead. Yeah, uh, two <laughs> questions. The first one was just how much interest i don't know uh, enough about your aquifers but how much interstate cooperation are you getting with adjoining states and my second question is how do you sleep at night <laughs> uh, yeah um I, I sleep okay uh there's there's a lot to think about but there's plenty of work that's for sure in terms of interstate cooperation you know, um, the biggest uh, uh, transboundary aquifer in terms of uh, interstate aquifers is the Ogallala aquifer up in the high plains. It goes all the way up to Nebraska and then into New Mexico. And to be quite honest, there's not a lot of uh, coordination. In fact, it's created some issues between New Mexico and Texas, where New Mexico is really scaling back. Groundwater over in the Ogallala is really not managed to much, and uh, at least not beyond the rule capture, really. In fact, they've accepted that they're 
um, going to mine the offer by 50% over 50 years. Um, so not much coordination up there. Um, most of the other offers are effectively mostly contained within Texas. That's the good thing about being really big. We, ha we have most of them in our boundaries. Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> Thank you. I'm Ingrid Padilla from the National Science Foundation. You showed a graph that I believe uh, was um, showing a decreasing availability of groundwater through time. And um, I think this is what the graph was about. So the question I have, is this um, due to recharge uh, deficit or is it because an increased use and constant recharge or a combination of both? So of that 12 million acre feet of availability that I showed up there, half of that comes from the Ogallala Aquifer up in the High Plains and um, the Gulf Coastal Aquifer systems. So up in the High Plains Aquifer, it really is a recharge deficit. They don't receive much recharge at all. There's a lot of water and storage in those sands. It's an unconfined aquifer. And so to support irrigated agriculture, again, they've had to manage, they've had to accept that the best they can do is manage towards keeping 50% of the saturated thickness in place over 50 years. So that, that's going to diminish over time, which explains some of the, the, the graph going down and to the right. Um, the Gulf Coast offers is experiencing subsidence due to overproduction. So they have to plan also for reducing production over time to mitigate for subsidence. So between those two primary aquifers, making up 50% of the total supply and those issues that are really going to curtail production in the future, that's, that's really where that's coming from. Everybody hungry? <laughs> okay. um, I, thank you for your presentation. Um, I was wondering, I mean, I, I'm not, I wasn't 100% sure if you are looking at water quality and uh, <clears throat> content with water quantity. There was a lot of conversation about water quantity. Uh, yeah. uh, so I would like for you to sort of make some comments on how the water quality generally is right. uh, throughout the Texas. And one one other question is, you mentioned ninety nine percent of your rural communities depend on private wells, and I was on groundwater. I'm sorry. On groundwater. On groundwater. Sorry. Yeah. Um, and I was wondering how the current uh, oil and gas production is impacting water quality in those communities, and do you have any sense of what's going on there? Right. Um, so you, you're you're exactly right. I was focusing more in on the water quantity sides of things. That's principally what our agency is focused on: is water supply planning for drought a record, and now we're flood planners, that's new. Um, but the TCQ, Texas Commission on, on Environmental Quality, they do most of the work on the water um, on, on the water quality side of things. We do have a network of wells that we uh, sample every year, but it's namely for natural constituents. Uh, we're not looking at organics or contaminants or any of those kind of things. That's what TCQ, the our sister agency, really looks at that. Railroad Commission, though, even though they're all a name, they manage the oil and gas industry. Uh, they don't have anything to do with railroads, by the way. Um, it's some artifact. It's weird. But they manage the oil and gas industry. And most of the <clears throat> the production is happening really, really deep in the subsurface. So there's not much of an effect associated with that or the fracking in terms of quality for the shallow domestic wells. Where you can see an impact shallow at the shallow level is from brine pits that might not be properly lined or that are leaking. So that can be an issue. Is there, is there a sense that that's happening or is it like they're hundred percent sure it's the fracking and the production is not impacting water quality? But there's one thing that you don't have the data, you're not looking for it. So right. it's, you assume it's not there. The second thing is you are looking for it and it's not impacting water quality. Yeah. The railroad commission, they do their best. You know, they're a small agency and it's, uh, it's a big industry. <clears throat> they do. Um, they've got, uh, most of the information that is submitted on water quality is self-reported by, by the industry. Um, but typically, if a, if a adjacent landowner has a domestic well that they feel like they has been compromised, they'll typically report that. We don't really see a whole lot of that. Um, most of it is, if they're complaining about anything, it's damage to the roads or, uh, you know, the, um, the smells and the nuisance conditions. That, that's really the, more the dominant complaint. But hydrologic fracking at... At deep in the subsurface really is probably not the bigger problem. It's uh, more how they manage that water at the surface. Great. I think we have one more question. Um, so we'll finish up with this and then then lunch. 
Okay. So in Texas, what communication or, or policy um, exists that ties the Texas Water Development Board with the DEQ, the, the water quality side, and, and in terms of moving forward and making sure those left and right hands are shaking? Right. Um, we do. We try to very clearly distinguish roles, but where we do have overlap, we've got, uh, we partner on, a, for example, there's a Texas Groundwater Protection Council that has membership of all agencies, and we frequently get together. We bring the piece that we're, that we're working on there that we can contribute, and we share information through that. We also, uh, again, on the groundwater side, we produce legislative reports by uh, every biennium that are co-authored by the two agencies. One example is a priority groundwater management area report to where collectively we look at the landscape of where there might be groundwater issues that uh, uh, might warrant the establishment of a groundwater conservation district. So we collectively get together, we share information, we produce those sort of reports and others. Railroad Commission um, is <clears throat> one uh, an example of where we're working really collaboratively with them is on this buffering of these injection wells to establish the brackish groundwater production zones. They have all the injection well data because they regulate, uh, uh, they have the USC program delegated from EPA. So we rely on their data to really uh, assess that. But the works they're do we're doing with the BRAX program to really uh, characterize the offers, they rely on our data to be able to set minimum surface casing uh, depth limits and provide information to the oil and gas industry. So we have a very um, collaborative re relationship with that agency. Um, we have, uh, the boss is going to tell us what to do. <laughs> um, we, we do have uh, lunch uh, for, for everyone, uh, for those who, who would like to partake. What we're going to do in part to give you a chance to get up and stretch and also commingle with others is we're um, going to provide you with a meal ticket that can uh, you can take up to the our cafeteria upstairs on the third floor, so one floor up, and you can just get whatever you'd like there. The only thing you have to do is put your name on that card and then when you get in line or you don't even have to stand in line, you just give them your card and take your tray away. Um, encourage you to use the cafeteria uh, tables to work with or talk with each other and eat. You can come back down here with your trays if you'd like to do that as well. Um, Courtney is walking that direction and she has the cards. So, and, and Carly has a batch back there. So two lines, more people can get through at once, that sort of thing. So I encourage you to um, uh, stretch and, and get something to eat and interact with your colleagues. And then please be back here sharply. I'll just say it, 126 so that we can start promptly at 130. Thanks everyone. 125 and 30 seconds. 125 and 30 seconds. So so moved. Thanks everyone. Thanks for a great morning.